It is 10 o'clock. And I think I see all of us. Considering we're doing this virtually, I'll do a, a roll call. Commissioner Cameron. Uh, good morning. I am here. Good morning. Commissioner O'Brien. I am here. Good good morning. Morning. Commissioner Zuniga. Good morning, everyone. I'm here. Great. Good morning. So we're all here. It is uh, June 24th, 2021. It's 10 a.m. And we're calling to order number public meeting number 348. Um, looks like a couple more meetings. We're going to reach an important goal. Um, we'll get we'll get started. Uh, just a reminder to those who are attending this meeting is being recorded. Commissioner O'Brien on the minutes, please. Certainly, uh, Madam Chair, there's meeting minutes in the packet today from April 26th, 2021. And I would move that the commission approve the minutes subject to any necessary changes for typographical error. Did everybody get a chance to review those? Any questions or comments for um, Eileen or Tanya? Just a second. Okay, thank you. Moving forward, then uh, thank you, Commissioner O'Brien. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. And I vote yes, four zero. Thank you. Thank you, very complete as, as always, thank you. Um, moving on then to the administrative update. Good morning, Executive Good morning. Director Wells. Good morning. Uh, for the first item for the administrative update, we just wanted to give uh, an update on the survey that we did. As you recall, we had changed the COVID policy internally for the commission. Uh, and this particularly pertains to those that are working on site, the gaming agents, racing, and some folks that are coming into the office. Uh, so we did do a survey. Uh, we got 27 responses to that survey. Uh, most people did respond that uh, they felt comfortable coming to work. They generally understood the safety guidelines and they largely trust that their colleagues are following the protocols. You know, a few indicated reservations of being in close contact with other people, which is not unexpected, but generally overall, um, the survey results uh, were positive. Um, they did not indicate that we need to make a change at this point based on the cumulative responses. But we should always be mindful of how people are feeling because this is a tricky time and we think about how people feel when they're at work. Um, so, you know, I am asking managers uh, to keep checking in, to keep uh, seeing how people are feeling, seeing if there are any concerns uh, because things may change and we just have to keep updated. Uh, but for purposes of the commission, at this point, uh, I'm not recommending that you make any changes to the uh, policy change made at the last meeting uh, when we discussed basically, you know, that folks could come in if they're vaccinated, not uh, not having to wear their masks and following the governor's rules. So uh, by and large, there was support for that. Does anybody have any questions on that? Okay. All right. So no the, questions, but positive report. Um, you know, yeah, I mean, good to yeah, hear that people are feeling safe in the workplace yeah, uh, for the most part. For the most part, that is that was the that was the uh, the results of the survey. Always have to be mindful that maybe outliers and not everybody feels the same way. So we just have to be mindful of how people are feeling. But generally, uh, as far as messaging and how people are feeling at work, okay, things are okay. Excellent. Yeah, thank you for that, Karen. Okay, and we'll keep we'll keep monitoring that. And HR is trying to keep the pulse on how people are feeling, particularly the folks that are working on site, so they'll keep at it. And, you know, we've got Bruce on, you know, he's watching his whole gaming agents team and his, um, you know, his um, field manager and his senior supervisors, they're, they're all mindful. They know that this is a little bit tricky. I don't know, Bruce, if you have any comments on, on how that's going in the field. As a matter of fact, I just had a, a senior staff meeting and asked everybody, seemed very comfortable uh, out there. We, you know, ask if anybody felt uncomfortable going out on the floor or intermixing and everybody said they were good okay okay so we'll, and, we'll keep an eye on it and bruce they all know that if they wish to wear a mask they should correct yes. and, yeah and it, right. exactly or we told people if they felt uncomfortable going out they they didn't have to so you know every everybody felt comfortable yeah excellent thank you great okay. 
So we're trying here, trying to really be uh, receptive to how people are feeling and, and we'll keep the lines of communication open. Right. Uh, okay, so the next agenda item, is just an update on the public meetings. I'm gonna turn it over to General Counsel Grossman to give an update on the change in the law um, based on the change in the governor's executive order. So I'll let Todd start there. And then I, we also have our communications division uh, here just to talk about some options for going forward and how we're doing the meetings. Well, thanks, Karen. Good morning, Madam Chair, Commissioners, uh, and everybody. Uh, happy to offer this update as to the status of the open meeting law. As you are, of course, aware, uh, certain provisions of the open meeting law were suspended by way of executive order during the state of emergency uh, that was declared by the governor due to the pandemic. Once the state of emergency was rescinded, that executive order sunset. So without any further action, the requirements set out in the open meeting law as it appears in general law chapter 30A section 18 through 25 would have resumed in full as they applied prior to the executive order. However, on uh, June 15th, uh, Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 was enacted, which instituted certain temporary amendments to the Open Meeting Law. This special act did a number of other things as well that are not directly related uh, to the Commission's business. There are two principles, though, in particular, uh, that were addressed in the executive order that have been continued in the special act that are important to recognize. First, the open meeting law requires that all meetings of a public body, such as the commission, be open to the public. Being open to the public means that members of the public have access to the meeting space where a public meeting is being conducted uh, so as to be able to observe any public deliberations. The executive order suspended that requirement as does the new special act. Um, and second, while the open meeting law does allow for remote participation by members of the public body, it also requires that a quorum of the body, including the chair, be present at the physical meeting location. The executive order suspended that requirement, as does the new special act. With that backdrop, there are a few specifics contained in the new act that should be noted. The first is that it suspended these provisions in the open meeting law until April 1st of 2022. So that is the end date uh, for these uh, amendments that I'll go through momentarily. The next uh, part is that as it pertains to the public access provisions of the open meeting law, the act provides that a public body, and I'm gonna quote here, uh, shall not be required to conduct its meetings in a public place that is open and physically accessible to the public, provided that if the public body does not conduct the meeting in a public place that is open and physically accessible to the public, the public body shall ensure public access to the deliberations of the public body for interested members of the public through, quote, adequate alternative means of public access. And the act specifically defines what adequate alternative means of public access are. It says that that is, those are uh, measures that provide transparency and permit timely and effective public access to the deliberations of the public body, including but not limited to providing public access through telephone, internet, uh, satellite enabled audio or video conferencing, or any other technology that enables the public to clearly follow the proceedings of the public body while those activities are occurring. HD meetings, for example, would seem to meet uh, that requirement. This remote access must be offered without subscription toll or similar charge to the public. So all of those are the uh, provisions that pertain to the public access part of the amendments to the open meeting law. And the next part, um, of the act pertains to the presence of the members of the public body. And the act uh, provides, and I'll, I'll quote here as well, that a public body may allow remote participation by all members in any meeting of the public body and a quorum of the body in the chair shall not be required to be physically present at a, spe a specified meeting location. So meeting in the fashion that the commission is doing here today, for example, is specifically allowed under the act. 
There are just a few other points uh, that are worth mentioning as well. If meetings are conducted remotely, the body must ensure that anyone entitled or required to appear before it shall be able to appear remotely, just as any member of the body itself. And finally, all other parts of the open meeting law and the attorney general's governing regulations otherwise remain in effect. So for example, things like the notice requirements that we're all familiar with and the roll call voting requirements and things of that nature are still required um, under the law. So the, the bottom line I would submit is that conducting meetings in the fashion here that we have been doing is perfectly permissible, but not mandatory, of course, under the new special act. Um, and I can pause there and happy to, um, to turn it over to you, Madam Chair, or, or field any questions that would be helpful. Thank, thank you, um, uh, Councillor Grossman. <clears throat> Commissioners, I thought that it'd be really helpful for, for you to hear that update. And this is why we're able to convene um, today in this, in this format. And, and really, just as we have been convening during, um, you know, when we were forced to do so with the onset of the pandemic. Um, with, with that comes some, um, some questions for us moving forward in terms of what we might in, envision our meetings to be. There's choices that we can consider. I don't think that's necessarily today's meeting topic, um, but I do, um, certainly Austin and Katrina have been thinking about the IT implications of, of, um, for the public meetings as well as for you know, return to work and, and, and what that might look like. And today they do have um, at least a, a, a something to report on for the interim as we consider, um, you know, the return to work issues going forward and, and what our, our space meetings will be like in the future. That makes sense. But do you have questions for Todd now on the law itself? Eileen, you're all set, Commissioner. Um, one that I think, uh, um, I'm, I'm just curious, I, I don't think the, the legislature addressed, but uh, you mentioned in, the, in your update um, that, that, that the new act uh, sunsets, these, these provisions that you described sunsets in April of 2022. Um, is there any indication from what they, the legislature did or didn't do as to whether any of these provisions will remain, or it's really way too early to tell now? I think it's the latter. Uh, I think it's still all under review, um, and everyone will see how this goes and take it from there. I thought so, thank you. So Commissioner Zuniga, um, uh, Director Griffin will continue to monitor that leg those legislative developments. Commissioner O'Brien and Commissioner Cameron, you'll remember too that we did submit um, a letter that uh, to the legislature supporting continuation of the virtual um, meetings because it, we've been able to optimize participation without worry about particularly our licensees being on the road during a snowstorm or, or those kinds of concerns. So. Um, yeah, I think for the people who want to attend uh, our meetings or do re regularly, at least in our case, and I can imagine this for many other bodies, yeah. attending it remotely is a lot more convenient. No travel, that's no parking, um, you know, you're going to have uh, connectivity, but, um, but that seems to be a lot more ubiquitous these days. That's right. So commissioners, you're all set for right now. Um, so then I think we can turn to our our uh, digital co coordinator, Austin Bumpus, this morning, and our communications director, Elaine Driscoll. Is that right, Karen? Is that the next plan? Yes, that is. Okay, great. Well, good morning, everyone. Options. Good morning, how are you? Good, good, how about you guys? Um, all right, so just kind of to lay out a background of what's been going on for the last, I guess, 15, 16 months, whatever it's been. Um, so for a notice perspective, we've been posting this call in information to these HD meetings, which is just the phone number, a meeting ID. So people can kind of dial in, join by phone, but we haven't been live streaming these meetings like we had been before the pandemic where we were in the office, had this live stream computer and all these cameras and stuff. 
Um, and then after these HD meetings, the video of the meeting gets posted to the website in the afternoon. And then it goes um, under our meeting archive section for whatever day that we're on there. Um, before this <laughs> extension happened last week, we had kind of been in the office testing options for these hybrid meetings where we'd have commissioners in the office, whoever else in the office, and then people able to join remotely as we have been since the pandemic started. And during that testing, we kind of figured out that our live stream system that we usually use, again, before the pandemic was no longer usable. Um, and it was kind of already feeling the effects of its age. This system has been in place for years at this point. And before the pandemic, you could kind of start to get a gauge that its age was kept catching up to it. Um, and when we're looking at replacing it, the pandemic started and that was all kind of put on hold. And then the 15 months away from the office kind of seemed to put that computer away for good at this point. Um, so just an update on kind of where we're at now, we're working on replacing that system, making sure it kind of fits our needs as we look ahead to the future, as we look ahead to hybrid capabilities or just anyone, any presenters being able to join remotely while we do the same thing we used to do. Uh, right now, we're just waiting on kind of quotes on that. We don't have a set or official kind of timeline on when we would have that new system set up in the office. Um, but regardless, the extension kind of gave us this extra time to figure out the best solutions going forward for that public meeting room. Uh, we've ordered some equipment that I personally think will be helpful going forward if we go with a hybrid approach with commissioners and some internal speakers in the office and then people externally as well. Um, but there are a few options that I think we can consider um, both for the immediate future and then what we'll have going forward. The first option is just continue what we've been doing since March of last year, where we post the call-in information, the phone number and meeting ID on the meeting notice, members of the public join by phone. Um, and as I mentioned, we haven't been live streaming in that specific routine over the last year and a half. And then we upload the meeting after the fact. For the second option for the immediate future, we can do exactly what we do now, but add in a live streaming piece of it through the HD meeting software itself so that people can watch these open meetings uh, through a video embedded on our website, similar to how we did before. Uh, it would free up people's phones. Um, they could see any presentations or documents that get screen shared during the meeting and just kind of help out on that front. And then soon, like I said, we ordered equipment. We'll hopefully have the capability to have you know, commissioners, executive director Wells, general counsel Grossman in the public meeting room uh, for this hybrid approach. Uh, and have speakers, they can participate in the meeting remotely as well. So if anyone from Encore, MGM, Planners Park wants to join remotely, they still could. This would, again, be live streamed through the HD meeting software and then would be visible through a video embedded on our website. Um, and then further down the line, when we have a new live stream computer and the new system in place in the public meeting room, we can just operate exactly like we used to before the pandemic and ideally still have that capability to allow for remote participation. Say there's a weather issue like you guys brought up that might create issues for external people or if there's a speaker from Las Vegas that wants to present on research or anything like that. But all in all, <clears throat> um, live streaming is definitely a good option. Live streaming through the HD meeting software and onto our website, which is kind of consistent with what we were doing before the pandemic. Um, it would allow media members, interested audience members, whatever, to watch the meeting video in real time. Um, obviously, it would allow for more kind of convenient access to the screen sharing elements, whether it's a presentation or a document. And it would also just free up people's phones for, obviously, these can be several hour long meetings at this point. It ties up your phone for all, all that time if you just dial in. So in the meantime, we're working with IT to kind of figure out the technical solution for hybrid meetings. And then, like I said, just waiting on the timeline for the live stream system. Um, happy to answer any questions anyone may have. And communications director Elaine Driscoll is back in the fray and able to help as well. Thank you, asking Commissioner Cameron. Yeah, I had one question. I know in the past when we had a commissioner who due to surgery or another reason was unable to attend in person, we uh, called in, dialed in, and with, were able to hear the meeting and, and watch it on the computer, but it was separate, and, and then um, speak 
um, you know, kind of coordinated that speaking or asking questions, but that piece was done by phone. Uh, the, the other commissioners could not see the commissioner who was participating. Would that remain the same from the system you're talking about, Austin? Yeah, it could in the same way that anyone could join right now via phone. Like if you have your phone and just join like that, it'll just show the little phone icon or say I turned my camera off right now and was still talking, it would just show kind of my name as what pops up on the screen. So it'd be the same exact concept. It's now just through this HD meeting vehicle rather than through a conference phone like we had in the meeting room. I want, I want to make sure I understand the difference um, between what we have currently and, and streaming with HD meeting or streaming through another piece of software. Currently, members of the public can get the meeting ID or the calling number, and I suppose join the meeting. They could decide not to show their faces, and that's totally fine, but there still be an icon or, or with their name on it. Um, or, or whatever they decide to put in. Is the benefit of streaming the notion that they could just look into the website and, and remain anonymous um, by virtue of not attending the meeting? Is that, is that one, of the, um, one of the features, if I'm getting this right? Correct, so they wouldn't have to physically join the meeting, uh, like you said, and then also you could see because right now when they're dialing in by phone, they don't have access to see right. what we're showing on the screen. So it allows for that. And yeah, it's just kind of Co freeing up your phone in general, I guess. So. Commissioner right. Zunica, I think I, I think I want to clarify one point. Um, and, and Austin and Elaine, please correct me if I've got this wrong. But <clears throat> when we send out the invitation to our current HD meetings, it goes to our entire team because that's just the setup we have. And then our team has to forward those invites to the participants. And under the new law, it's required that any participant be able to participate in, to the same extent, if I understand correctly, that we participate as commissioners. So in other words, be able to be a tile in the HD meeting, or if we were live, that they would be able to be, um, have access to our public meeting. If you're a member of the public, Right now, you may not join our meetings visually because they don't have the link. They only have the phone number. So, for instance, mm -hmm. Elaine has mentioned that, you know, the media who might want to join our meetings really can only, unless they are forwarded the link because they asked, um, would have to join by phone and it ties up their phone. Unfortunately, that, that concern was never raised to me. Um, because I get it now, right? Uh, it's hard to have your phone tied up the entire time. Um, and, and I think maybe Austin's gonna get to this, an alternative to, so the, the way that this would allow is that there'd be streaming going on, just, just like the legislature did the other day with the sports gaming testifying, they had their stream going on and I watched the streaming and those who are participating got an invitation to participate through the virtual platform, but I could watch the streaming of all of everyone at the same time. So um, that that's the, the option. The other option, and, and I suspect Austin's going to get to this. Uh, were you planning on getting to the option of the, the the we could put out the link, right on our on our, and and with that comes a little bit of a navigation issue, right? Because then everyone could join our. Um, have access in exactly the way that we have access right now. But that's manageable too. Uh, but does that help you? That very much. I guess I, I assumed incorrectly that, that the link was available no. to, for anybody you know, to see that no. it required it's, to be forwarded or, or um, available yes. upon asking. And, and we've lived with that for 15 months and, and it's worked. Um, it hasn't been seamless. Uh, you know, it really requires the team to remember to send the link to participants. Um, and it means that some folks who might at the last minute want to, you know, watch, haven't been able to watch, you know. So the streaming allows at least watching. They would not show up in our tiles. 
Yes, thank you. Is that is that Elaine's nodding her head? Elaine, do you want to elaborate? Yeah, I, I mean, I think uh, thank you, Austin. I think you did a, a wonderful job. Wonderful in, in covering it all. Um, you know, for me, it simply boils down to the fact that um, my preference would be um, if the commission agrees. Um, to pr provide the live stream on our website. It's simply the pre-pandemic practice um, and for the reasons that everybody stated, which is that um, it is a bit cumbersome to have to listen to a conference call for what amounts to sometimes hours at a time. Um, Chair uh, made the great uh, analogy of precisely how the legislature did it during the sports betting hearing the other day um, into Commissioner Zuniga's point about convenience. Um, and I just think that adding this element until the um, uh, until we pr uh, finalize this hybrid technical solution, it makes sense in the meantime to stream on the website, if that's okay. There's no big additional cost, correct, Austin? Correct. From what I understand, it's just through basically the same software that we have now, and it's just going live to wherever. Austin, does it? I know that before. I wish I understood this technology better, quite frankly. It, we, we had um, really uh, great um, access for those um, who could not he hear us, is that right? Um, yes, it was for, we had closed caption. That Correct. doesn't, that, will that happen now with the streaming? Not with the current system, okay. not, and that's just not really, I don't think it's possible it until we get the live streams, like the physical computer where we could do it in the meeting room like usual. That's what I thought it would require that additional piece. So that that's a, a bit of a challenge and, and we should continue to explore any enhancements on that front as we go forward. Correct, but YouTube videos do develop closed captioning as well when we upload. Oh, they do. Oh, so okay. at least if you're watching it after the fact, you could get captioning. Oh, excellent. Okay, thanks. thanks. Commissioner Bryan? No, I was just following up. I, I, I'm glad I've, Elaine put in her preference because my question with just sending the link out is there's a control issue in terms of uh, we don't have the technology to have two types of invites, right? A view only and then a view and participate. So it seems like the solution is the internal invite meetings that allow participation and then the live streaming that allows you to do that without tying up your phone. So that was the question, but it seems like the recommendation from uh, Elaine and Austin answered that for me, unless I'm That's wrong. Right. Austin, that's your recommendation, right? Correct. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Commissioner Cameron, do you have any questions or comments? No, I agree with the recommendation. It makes perfect sense to me that the um, you know, participants are, are issued the link and those who just want to uh, observe our meeting, as in the past, will be able to um, via the live stream. So that makes sense. And Todd, that meets all of the, the new requirements, correct? So that could go forward for our next public meeting, um, right? Austin, it's pretty seamless. Yeah, it should be. For for open meetings, I would say. For, yeah, okay, be great. Because we did not stream agenda setting before the pandemic. Right, well, and the agenda setting is of course open too, but what you're, um, but what you're saying would just be our continued practice to make it public noticed and the uh, public is invited, but they can invite, they can come in by, um, by phone in those instances. Correct. Okay, excellent. This this item is listed as a vote. Are we, is that not necessary? I think we preserved it, but do we, well, I think. Yeah, we put that in just the abundance of caution. You know, if, if there's a consensus, staff can go forward. I don't think it's necessary, okay. but we just wanted to make sure in case something came up that uh, we somewhat, uh, that indicated yeah. the vote might be necessary, but I think we're Very good, thanks. Yeah, it, it's an excellent recommendation that came last week, and I thought it was important for all of us to know that we were, if we were going to be streamed, we know it in advance, just, you know, as an understanding. I think it's a, I think it really is a cure to a practical problem that I wish I had understood earlier. So, great. Thank you, Austin, and thanks for, Austin and Katrina have really had to put on their innovation caps and and um, it continues to evolve i think that's the topic of lots of organizations right now so thank you for 
all the effort. Thank you, Elaine. All right, can we move on then to um, item 3C? Yes, so that's the uh, on-site casino updates. I'll turn that over to Director Lilios and Assistant Director Van. Uh, thanks, Karen. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, Commissioners. So we have a brief update for you uh, this week, uh, starting with Plain Ridge Park Casino. Uh, and really, all three of the properties are taking great advantage of their outdoor space now that it's summertime, and you know that aligns uh, perfectly on the uh, uh, pandemic piece as well. Uh, with respect to uh, Plain Ridge Park, you voted to extend the boundary of their space last week and as of this weekend they will be taking advantage of that new uh, what they are terming their patio section uh, on the racing uh, apron uh, that will be open Friday and, and Saturday with Saturday uh, having some live music they are partnering on that space with a local brewery uh, 67 degrees, they've got their food trucks ready to go. Uh, so um, they expect to be making good use of that space throughout the summer. Uh, their Revolution Lounge is going to be opening in uh, July and they've got uh, DJ and, and live music expected uh, for that. Uh, they are targeting a July opening for Fluties as well, but they are still in the process of hiring uh, kitchen and, and wait staff, but they're hoping that that will open in July. Uh, with respect to Encore, their full complement of amenities are operating and they've got a, a complement of outdoor activities as well with outdoor music Thursday evening starting tonight on the South Lawn. Uh, their bear garden in uh, that operates under their Harbor Walk light uh, alcohol license Thursdays through Sunday for a modest size uh, area of uh, accommodating approximately 50 people. They've got uh, brunches, champagne brunches scheduled for three Sundays in July uh, on the South Lawn. Uh, the nightclub uh, had already opened weekends and is expected to be open again. Uh, this weekend. Uh, MGM is uh, pretty much status quo from our last uh, update. Uh, they are continuing with their outdoor uh, concert series on Friday evenings, uh, which I understand has been, uh, uh, has been well received. Uh, and as for IEB, we're continuing to work with the operational teams at each of the properties to ensure uh, adequate security uh, and safety measures are in place for all of these uh, all of these events. Um, I know uh, Assistant Director Band may have some uh, pieces on the gaming operations side uh, for you, so I can ask him to jump in and uh, we're happy to answer any questions you might have. Yes, uh, I, I really have nothing extraordinary to report over the last couple weeks. Uh, except all three properties have been very busy. Uh, operations have been going smoothly, uh, and that's kind of what we, we hope to see. Uh, been nothing but cooperation from the three properties, uh, and we continue to move forward uh, back to normalcy. Any questions? All set. Okay. Yeah. Excellent Bye. report. Thank you, uh, Loretta and Bruce. So Karen, does that conclude your um, administrative update? Yes, it does. So we're gonna move on to uh, legal division and we have our guests, Todd, if you could introduce them before we get started. Good morning. Good morning once again. Good morning. Uh, oh, hey, Jed. Um, so um, just by way of teeing this up uh, real quick, the commission has been notified of a proposed transfer of interest of the gaming establishment that comprises MGM Springfield, essentially from the licensee to a real estate investment trust, which is, as we know, known as a REIT. And as you mentioned, Madam Chair, we're joined today by teams from the two parties in interest, uh, being MGM Growth Properties, which is the REIT, and MGM Resorts International, which is, of course, the parent uh, of the gaming licensees. And uh, I do have some introductory remarks I'd like to offer, but before I get into that, perhaps I can turn it over to Attorney Nozel 
uh, who we all are familiar with, and ask him to introduce uh, the team of guests. Uh, thank you, Todd. Uh, good morning, Mission. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes, we can. Great. Uh, so as I uh, indicated, uh, I serve as a for MGM International and uh, several of its affiliates. Um, some of them are appearing before you today, including Blue Tarp Redevelopment, uh, MGM Properties, LLC. Uh, joining me today are Work, the chief hey, excuse me, uh, Chad, we do have feedback coming from you, and I, I think you'll want to be really clear. Um, I don't know how to help you, though. It's, it's, Enrique, does Commissioner Zuniga, do you have a suggestion for Mr. Nozel? Um, it, these may have already uh, worked itself, but if you, if, um, if everybody can mute themselves while, um, well, as a single person is talking, that might help. And Jen, you're on mute now. Jed, you're on Jed, you're on mute. There it is. Hi. There, yeah, so, yeah, let's let's try again. You just were it was a little choppy and I, we want to really be able to hear you, so thanks. It oh, may right. help, Jed, if you go a little closer to the microphone. And, and you're on mute. I'll try to unmute you, Jed, but you, you are on mute again. Thanks. Oh. Let me see if I can help. Is that okay? You're on unmute now. Let's see if we can hear you. Is that can you hear me? And much better so far. Okay, no problem. Um, so, uh, Chair, uh, thank you again. I apologize for the technical challenge. So, I'm uh, here today on behalf of MGM Resorts International and certain of its affiliates um, who are collectively uh, petitioning for uh, a transfer. Um, uh, um, in connection with um, MGM Springfield and MGP um, growth properties. Um, I am uh, pleased to introduce uh, several members of the team today. Uh, first, we have uh, James Stewart, who's the Chief Executive Officer of MGM Growth Properties, Patrick Madamba, who I think many of you know, uh, Senior Vice President and Legal Counsel for MGM Resorts International, Laura Norton, Senior Vice President and Legal Counsel for MGM Resorts International, Jessica Cunningham, Senior Vice President, Legal Counsel and Assistant Secretary to MGM Resorts International, as well as Seth Stratton, Vice President and Legal Counsel to MGM Springfield. Thank you, uh, Jed and Madam Chair. If I can uh, just jump into a few uh, introductory remarks um, and then we'll turn back over to the, our guests. Um, so, uh, the, the, all of our guests are here today to describe the proposed transaction in, in more detail, and they'll certainly be available for questions uh, as well, momentarily. They're specifically here today, though, requesting that the Commission opine on two narrow legal issues related to the transaction, which I'll outline for you momentarily. Before doing so, however, I thought it might be helpful to just walk through uh, the law related to transfers of interest of the sort being proposed uh, here today. And as you'll recall, Chapter 23K expressly uh, allows for transfers of interest and discusses uh, transfers in a number of areas. The Commission supplemented those statutory provisions with a regulatory framework that more fully outlines the process that is codified in sections 116.08 through 116.10 of the commission's regulation. And essentially, I would submit that the regulatory process is designed to do two things. First is to ensure that the commission has an opportunity to determine whether a proposed transfer will result in any new qualifiers, and if so, to make sure that those new qualifiers submit to the RFA1 suitability review process such that an appropriate investigation may be conducted and a decision ultimately issued by the commission. And second, that the process is designed 
to determine whether there will be uh, a, a, a change of control over the gaming license uh, resulting from the transfer such that the quality of the gaming operation or any license conditions including host or surrounding community commitments and other similar commitments will be affected. And the following principles uh, apply to those uh, considerations and govern uh, the commission's review of a proposed transfer of interest. The, the, some of these come right from the statute, others come from the regs. So we start by recognizing that the law provides that no person shall transfer a gaming license, a gaming establishment, or associated structure, real property, premises, or facility without notification to the IEB and approval by a majority of the commission. The commission shall require anyone with a financial interest in a gaming establishment to be qualified for licensure by meeting the criteria provided in sections uh, 12 and 16 of chapter 23K. The, those are the provisions, of course, that uh, offer us our suitability standards. The transfer is also subject to section 129.01 of the commission's regulations which looks specifically at whether a transfer will result in a change of control over the gaming license. If there will be such a change, the transferee is essentially required to agree to assume all existing obligations of the licensee. And we define a change of control in the regulations to mean that it's a transfer of interest which directly or indirectly results in a person obtaining greater than 50% ownership in a gaming licensee or which results in or is likely to result in a significant change to the management or operation of a gaming license. In the present case, the parties have asserted that there will not be any impact to the control of the gaming license. So th that is ultimately a determination that the commission will have. Whenever a person contracts to transfer any property relating to an ongoing gaming establishment, as opposed to an open market transfer, um, under circumstances which require that the transferee be deemed suitable, the contract shall not specify a closing or settlement date which is earlier than 121 days after the submission of a completed RFA-1 application. This provision allows the IEB and the commission to investigate and at least preliminarily rule on the suitability of any new qualifiers related to the transferee. The RFA-1 application shall be accompanied by a fully executed and approved trust agreement. The trust, as you'll recall, is a vehicle designed to effectuate the clean separation of a transferee that may be deemed unsuitable from its interest in the gaming license or gaming establishment, if that should become necessary. The law also requires that the commission hold a hearing and render a decision on what is referred to as interim authorization for the applicant. If the commission grants interim authorization, then the closing or settlement of the deal may occur prior to a final suitability determination being made. This interim authorization process was included, presumably, in recognition of the fact that a full suitability investigation may understandably take some time to complete. And so as not to keep the deal in a holding pattern of sorts, this process allows the transaction to close with only essentially a preliminary suitability determination being made and an overall assessment being made uh, after the full investigation is completed. The commission or IEB may at any time after the grant of interim authorization though, order all of the interest subject to the transfer be transferred into the trust. If there, is, if there exists any reasonable cause to believe that the proposed transferee may be found unsuitable. If a prospective transferee fails or refuses to timely transfer any such interest into the trust upon direction, uh, from the commission or the IEB, the transferee shall be issued a negative determination of suitability. When it comes to the ultimate decision as to whether to approve the transfer, there are a couple of other considerations uh, that are worth noting here. The commission may place any additional conditions or restrictions on a transfer that the commission uh, considers uh, suitable. 
the commission shall reject a gaming license transfer or transfer of interest in a gaming establishment to any unsuitable person. The commission shall not approve of any transfer that will result in the transferee having a financial interest in more than one license issued by the commission. And the commission may result, uh, may excuse me, may reject a transfer if the commission considers the transferee unsuitable. Ultimately, the commission may reject a proposed transfer that in its opinion would be, quote, disadvantageous to the interests of the Commonwealth, unquote. And the commission has offered some examples of what uh, a situation where the transfer is disadvantageous may apply. And it noted things like a failure of the transferee to meet the suitability standards, that any provisions of the regulations or chapter 23K are not properly followed, or uh, that there are issues related to the change of control. That's, that's kind of a broad overview of transfers of interest as contained in uh, the regulations and the statute. And again, the commission will have another opportunity to review uh, many of these uh, issues uh, in the, the coming days when the parties are back for a formal interim authorization finding. But as I mentioned, they're here today um, for a finding relative to two narrow issues. And those two issues are whether the term of years from the resulting lease and sublease are satisfactory under the law. And second, for approval of the trust instrument that has been submitted as required in accordance with the regulations. The term of years issue stems um, from a provision of chapter 23K. Um, and in the case before you, the resulting lease uh, that is being proposed by the parties would result in what is essentially a term of years of 40, a uh, term of the lease, which is 45 years. And that includes options to extend that I, I believe the parties will address with you more specifically. As, as you may recall, there's a provision in Chapter 23K, though, that addresses the control of land on which a gaming establishment sits. And that's found in Section 15, Paragraph 3. And I wanted to just uh, read a part of that for you to help uh, tee this issue up. And the law provides that no applicant shall be eligible to receive a gaming license unless the applicant meets the following criteria and clearly states as part of an application that the applicant shall own or acquire within 60 days after a license has been awarded the land where the gaming establishment is proposed to be constructed. Provided, however, that ownership of the land shall include a tenancy for a term of years under a lease that extends not less than 60 years beyond the term of the gaming license issued under this chapter. Um, and that is the end of the relevant provision. So the question is whether this provision applies to the present situation and serves as a bar to a lease that is less than the term of the license plus 60 years. You may recall the commission addressed this issue once before in 2018 when it reviewed a transaction involving Plain Ridge Park Casino. And we can get a little bit more into detail on that um, as we uh, pursue this discussion. The second issue that the parties have brought before you relates to the proposed trust instrument. Uh, by statute and regulation, a trust is, as I mentioned before, a necessary piece of any, any proposed transfer of interest. And the regulations spell out the required components of a trust. That's contained in section 116.10, paragraph 6. The trust instrument is required to contain such things as the identity of the trustee, the manner in which the property will be transferred in the event the commissioner of the IEB direct the property into the trust and how it'll be handled upon a final uh, suitability determination. So that's essentially the second issue uh, that is before you here today. And of course, we can get into more detail about those particular sections or conversations as well. So though, that's an oversight, an overview, I should say, of all of the issues that are before you uh, here today. So I, I'd like to stop there. I can, of course, take any questions about the law and regulations or Madam Chair, um, if it's okay, we can also turn it over uh, to the petitioners uh, to present their proposal. 
Um, I'd suggest that we move forward and then, <clears throat> Councillor, that you'd be available for questions as they arise. Does that make sense, Commissioners? Thanks. Thank you. I can't tell, Jed. I believe you're on mute again. Let me see if I can help you. There you go. Thanks, Chair. Can you hear me? We can. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So as uh, Todd indicated, the petitioners are appearing before the Commission today in connection with a pending request for approval of a contractual transfer under the Commission's regulations of MGM Springfield's gaming establishment property, ultimately from MGM to MGP Growth properties, a publicly traded real estate trust. The transfer of the ownership of interest, including the real property relating to Blue Tarp's gaming establishment, does not involve a change in control of the licensee Blue Tarp, which remains responsible for the operation of MGM Springfield and all of its license and regulatory responsibilities. Should the transaction be approved by the commission, Blue Tarp will continue to operate the casino but will lease the gaming establishment property, ultimately from MGP Growth Properties, governed by a master lease between MGM and MGP. Today, as Todd indicated, we seek to review two discrete legal matters with the commission that are important for the transaction to close should the commission grant interim authorization. The form of the required trust agreement and the lease term of the sublease. We request review of these matters in advance of the Commission's interim authorization determination, as they are, if not uh, the only, but uh, the, the most important legal issues in connection with the transaction. That is important, and it's important to have clarity on these in advance of the closing, which will be scheduled within three business days of the interim authorization. But prior to turning to these matters, we would like to provide the Commission with some background on MGP growth properties, which along with certain other subsidiaries and personal qualifiers seek to be qualifiers of Blue Tarp, as well as review the basics of the underlying transaction. So if there aren't any initial questions from the commission, I'm gonna turn it over to James Stewart. And after that, to Laura Norton, who will provide an overview of the transaction and some key terms. I'll then come back to address uh, the two issues that we discussed uh, and explain in a little more detail why both the trust agreement and the lease term are in conformance with the Gaming Act, the Commission's regulations, and previous precedent of the Commission. So, Good Mr. Morning. Stewart. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to thank all of you for the opportunity to present to you here this morning. I um, have a, well, I have, I was going to say I have a very fond spot only because I went, not only, but part of the reason is because I attended business school at Dartmouth College, the Tuck School, and I would drive to Boston on a regular basis um, over the, on the weekend. Did you, did you lead with the Dartmouth thing because you are <laughs> an undergraduate? <laughs> Good, well, well, well planned, uh, Jed. And, and uh, Mr. Stewart, uh, Commissioner Zuniga's son is there now, so double Dartmouth. All right, congratulations. Right. But you can, you can now go fast. back to Boston if you'd like. <laughs> well, if he has 50% as much fun as I had, that may be a bit too much. I, I suggest he focus on his studies a little more. But uh, I used to travel frequently. I'd be interviewing for jobs in New York. And so I would drive, and Boston, I would drive back and forth through Springfield very frequently and stop at the NBA Hall of Fame, right? I really enjoyed that. And I would, you know, grab a... Burger, go to the NBA Hall of Fame, and then continue on with my drive. But uh, I have loved Boston with one exception, which is I am a Golden Knights fan and not a Bruins. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only uh, negative that I can say. Commissioner Cameron is is shaking. <laughs> well, we have our hands full with uh, with Montreal Canadiens here already, but we anyway. are usually pretty good at turning uh, turning fans our way, but you're allowed to root for your own team. We won't hold it against. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, I'll give a brief intro on sort of what M we colloquially we just call it MGP on what MGP is and sort of all about. It's um, 
it's a very, it's the development out of an interesting set of circumstances that um, have sort of followed along in the gaming business, really developing over the past decade, I think has actually really improved the business. The, um, so MGP, uh, and I'm the CEO of MGP, MGP is about a $10 billion market cap real estate investment trust. We have just under a billion dollars of revenue and uh, are 42% owned by MGM Resorts, and we're a subsidiary of MGM Resort. Um, the REIT was formed in the middle of the last decade, really due to a uh, evolving realization that the way that the gaming business had prior funded itself was improving. And what that, that meant was uh, there was a in uh, enlarging and developing pool of capital money that wanted to invest in gaming resort real estate and had really almost no options to do so. And that type of capital typically wants sort of steady current returns that we provide in the form of dividends and was quite a different sort of profile of investor than what would invest than the type of investor that would invest in a gaming operator, which is a little more subject to the ups and downs of the business cycle as we all. So MGM, in the middle of the last decade, and I was uh, working with them to sort of think through how all of this would come together, separated into a real estate company, and an operating company. The operating company would pay rent to the real estate company. We took the real estate company public in April 2016, and uh, you know, thankfully was a, uh, a terrific initial public offering, really well received by the public. We raised well over a billion dollars and uh, we're off to the races. So um, that permitted the operators to reduce their need to borrow significant amounts of money from the banks or bond investors or whatever in order to own, acquire, or develop these types of assets because the REIT would effectively fund the sort of real estate side of things and really lets them be less levered and more nimble operators as opposed to um, having to raise this huge amount of money just to own and keep this, uh, these types of assets going. The, the, the industry really followed the same path as the hotel industry before it. You went back into the 60s and 70s. You had Hilton and Marriott and Hyatt own and operate the hotel. And the same kind of thing evolved there, where nowadays you have really, in almost, in almost every situation, you have different investors. A lot of times it'll be institutions like pension funds and so on will own the hotel. And then Hilton or Hyatt or Marriott or whoever will manage the hotel. And the gaming business being um, a later developing industry than the hotel business kind of followed that same pattern. So uh, the REIT era is um, sort of upon us. And if you look at MGM or Caesars or Penn National, who I know you dealt with in the Plain Ridge situation, and a lot of these other operators, many of them are moving along this path because it just permits them greater access to capital in a way that is more efficient to finance, own, develop, acquire these types of assets. So uh, we have a little presentation that I know we sent to you. I'm gonna just tick through quickly page, it's numbered page two, but it's the first real page of the presentation after the cover page. So um, we break down sort of the basics of the company into four components. The rental stream, I think we're the only read, at least that I know of, that collected 100% of its rent throughout the past year, irrespective of the terrible outcome economically from the COVID crisis. We have no near-term lease expirations, so there's very little risk in terms of that component. We have bought about just a little under $7 billion of other gaming real estate assets since our IPO, which allowed us to diversify the portfolio. We have over $12 billion of book value of assets now on the books. The other thing is we have a corporate guarantee from MGM Resorts and all of our assets are included in one big master lease. What this means is MGM pays a rent check to operate all of the assets within the lease and they have no ability to really separate out, you know, there's no individual lease against any one asset. So if one asset isn't um, pulling on the ore of, uh, you know, generating enough you know, significant capital, the other assets shore that one up and vice versa. So it's a nice situation. We've had 13 dividend increases since our IPO. And uh, when we went public, we had a uh, dividend that was $1.43 and it's now $2.06. So we have half 
the investors on our side who are looking to continue to invest more capital as well. So I'm, I'm pretty pleased with overall how this whole situation has come about. And um, if you look at the relative valuations of MGM and MGP, MGP has grown from about $5 billion to, to $10 billion of market cap. Our stock price has gone from $21 to $37. And MGM also has grown from this ballpark, say, $18 when this separation was announced to around $42 today, which is um, a really nice validation from the equity holders who invest in both. The next page of the press goes through briefly our portfolio and we show a map of the United States. We're entirely US based. Uh, we have a, one of the things that uh, we strive for in our business is to have a diversified operation such that you're not subject to the economic ups and downs of any one uh, region. I think we've achieved a pretty nice um, balance here. We have eight assets in Las Vegas and then eight assets outside of Las Vegas and other gaming jurisdictions. Springfield, obviously. We also have Empire City, Borgata in Atlantic City, National Harbor in um, Maryland in the DC area, Gold Strike in Tunica, Beau Rivage in um, Alexi, and so on. 16 assets in total, even split. A little bit on MGM, the tenant is what we have on page four. Um, we're in a very great position in that we have the best tenant in the business, I would say by far. All our properties that I mentioned are under a master lease. MGM has over $6 billion of access to immediate cash, either in the form of cash or revolver. That is six times their rent check to us. So they're very, very liquid and have, you know, no, they could, uh, you know, the rent is not a excessive burden to them. The company is a $21 billion company. So, you know, meaningful access to any capital. Their debt rates have gone to very low levels post this transaction, about 4%. And um, the other nice thing that I love about having MGM as a tenant is they draw revenues and cash flows uh, from multiple sources. And if you look on the right <clears throat> of this page, you see all of their different types of brands, locations, activities that go on inside the facility, you know, ranging from everything from uh, um, gaming tables to hotels to restaurants to nightclubs to, you know, you name it, right? So lots of different sources of activity inside the building. Um, leaving us um, in, a, I think, a very good spot and leaving MGM in a good spot with both, you know, meaningful access to capital no one is um, excessively burdened by any amounts of debt or any kind of obligation. Uh, we are 42% owned, as I said, by MGM, which I think is a very nice um, alignment of interests. And um, I think that that's it. So I would, uh, I guess I'll turn it back to you, Jed, or open it up for questions, whatever you would like. Uh, I'll turn it over to my colleagues, Jessica and Laura, to go through some details. Yeah. Chair, we can, we can pause there if there are any specific questions pertaining to uh, MGP, uh, or we can go right to Laura um, uh, and Jessica to talk a little bit more about this particular transaction. Commissioners, shall we continue? Commissioner Seneca, it looks like you have a, uh, you're leaning in. Yeah, just, uh, just because I, I, I like very much the summary from Mr. Stewart, I had a sort of that type of question. Um, what makes a good candidate for, to, to, for, for the property to come into the master lease or to come into this transaction? Because not every property um, that MGM owns is, at least currently, part of, the, of this breed. Certainly the international ones would not, but can you s talk a little bit about the trajectory or, 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 or why most, but not all of them? So, uh one of the goals that we had what, what that that appealed most to the type of investor that invests in real estate investment trusts like this was again diversification across geographies which was very important um because if you know las vegas has its ups and it has its downs just like any region and you know if you're too heavy into las vegas that gives people concern on whether or not it, you have enough sources that are diverse enough so that's a big component of it other thing that we really look for is we want to be, we want to have a property that is 
uh, the, the sort of the biggest and the quote unquote best, meaning best fit and finish, most activities going on inside it, and um, access to lots of different customer base in its particular region. Um, if you look at, I think, every property that we own, that's been one of the things that we've really striven for as a company, um, it is always very, very nice fit and finish, draws lots of different customers from the high end to the middle end, um, and offers lots and lots of activities. And what that gives us is the confidence that, you know, if um, there's no big movies out right now and the movie theater's not doing well, people, you know, the, the um, restaurants will do well and so on and so forth. Um, with the other assets that are not in the master lease uh, with us, um, they are Las Vegas owned. Since we already own 50% of our portfolio in Las Vegas, we have, it's not that we're not willing to do a transaction in Las Vegas, but I think there was more of an impetus from our own investors to try to try to diversify away from that one center in order to balance out the portfolio a little. Thank you. Any other questions, commissioners, at this stage? All right, let's continue, uh, Jed. Thank you. Yep. Uh, thanks. I'll turn it over to Laura Norton. Hello. Good morning, commissioners, Good morning. Madam Chair. Um, again, I'm Laura Norton, in-house counsel for MGM Resorts. Um, I apologize in advance. It looks like occasionally my video is flashing. Um, I don't know if you see it, but I do. So if it becomes too annoying, let me know and I'll, I'll turn it off. Um, all this great technology and every once in a while you get the kinks too. Um, I'm going to provide a brief transaction overview. And if you have your presentation materials, I'd like to refer you to slide five, which has the um, transaction outlined. And I'd like to point out that in this slide that um, all of the entities that are involved in the transaction are depicted um, on, this, on the slide. And the slide is reflective of what occurs um, after the closing of the transaction. So this would be the state of the structure post-closing. Um, you can see at the top right, there's a box, MGM, and underneath that box is a triangle for blue tarp redevelopment, um, which is, of course, the gaming licensee. And um, the blue tarp redevelopment currently sits in the organizational structure as depicted on this slide, such that blue tarp redevelopment will remain under MGM after completion of the transaction in the same place that it does today. Um, there's no change of control of this entity, and this entity will continue to be the gaming licensee and the operator of the property um, after the transaction is completed. If you look over on the left-hand side of the chart, you'll see at the top in a circle, public. Underneath the public sits MGP, um, which is the REIT. And at the very bottom of that um, column, it's MGM Springfield Redevelopment. And I'll just refer to that entity as Springfield for the purposes of our discussion today. Springfield is the owner of the real estate or the real property um, for MGM Springfield. And it's the only entity that moves during this transaction. Currently, the Springfield entity is owned and resides under Blue Tarp, under MGM. Um, and currently, Springfield leases the real property to Blue Tarp through an intercompany lease. When the transaction occurs, it'll occur through a series of steps, and all of these steps pretty much occur simultaneously. Um, upon completion of the transaction, the final result will be that the Springfield entity, along with that intercompany lease, will be acquired by MGP and will be dropped down to the bottom of the structure under MGP lessor, as shown in the bottom left corner of the slide. Springfield will ultimately then lease the property to Blue Tarp through a lease and a series of subleases. Um, these 
this lease is the intercompany lease and is shown on the slide as well as the subleases. The intercompany lease is going to remain in effect, but it will now be between Springfield Redevelopment and MGP Lessor. And you can see that by the dashed line to the left of those two entities. Then if you follow the dashed line over to the right-hand side of the page, you'll see that MGP Lessor in turn leases the property to MGM Lessee under the existing master lease. MGM Lessee is the entity that is the tenant for all of the MGM properties under the master lease. MGM Lessee, in turn, will sublease the property to Blue Tart under what we call an operating sublease. And this is the same structure for all MGM properties that are under the master lease, um, i.e. MGM Lessee is the landlord to all of the gaming licensees by way of an operating sublease. Um, Blue Tarp again remains in place, and the lease with Blue Tarp um, provides Blue Tarp the right to continue as the gaming lic licensee and the operator of the property. I'll pause there for a minute if there's any questions about the transaction structure. Questions? Um, I'm, I'm presuming, commissioners, you had the um, the graphic in front of you so you could follow. Um, Thank you. Good. Thank you. I think we're all set. Okay. Then um, I'd like to turn over to slide six in or the presentational material, page six. And this is just a brief overview of some of the key lease provisions um, of the MGM master lease. And one of the important provisions, of course, is the rent. Um, under the master lease, the rent will increase to reflect the addition of MGM Springfield property. It will increase by amount of $30 million, consisting of $27 million in fixed rent and $3 million of percentage rent. The purchase price is $40 million in cash. And there is a guarantee on the lease by MGM Resorts International and that guarantee will continue and apply to the lease obligations of Blue Tarp as well as MGM lessee. The lease term for the Springfield property is laid out in the presentation material as well. As already discussed, the lease term is approximately 45 years. This consists of three different components. The first component being the remaining term under the existing master lease, and that'll take us out to April 2026. After that, there are five, or I'm sorry, four five-year renewals, total of 20 years, under the existing master lease. So that takes us out to April 2046. The seventh amendment, which adds MGM Springfield to the master lease, will contain four additional five-year renewals, so that the total lease term then will take out to April 2066. At the bottom, you'll see a, a row for NNN lease. Uh, NNN lease is a triple net lease. Um, what that means generally in the leasing community is that the tenant is responsible for taxes, insurance, and all other property related costs. So Blue Tarp, as the tenant of this particular lease, will pay all of these costs under the master lease and the operating sublease. I'll pause there if there's any questions on the lease. Commissioner Simica? Yeah, thank you. I um can you just briefly explain the percentage rent? Is that a variable component? Um and is the 30 million of the rent annualized throughout all of the life of the renewal options? Um so the fixed rent um component is subject to a fixed escalation each year. The percentage rent component is subject to a reset, and that reset occurs every five years, and it's based on net revenues of the company. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. 
other questions? Oh yes, this is for this. Um, good, you know, also good for the record. Um, those, um, all of those uh, renewals uh, are at the at the sole discretion of the tenant, right? The landlord doesn't weigh in on those renewals. Those renewals are at the tenant's option. Yes. Thank you. Can I ask, um, Mr. Grossman, do we? Does the commission have any control over the tenant's obligation to extend, to exercise that option? Um, not, not directly, uh, certainly not in the lease itself. Um, the commission right. and um, uh, Ms. Norton and others may be able to explain this better, but you know, there are provisions um, in these operating documents that recognize the commission's role in overseeing the gaming establishment and the gaming license, but there's, I don't believe there's any specific um, uh, role for the commission to play in the extension of the lease itself. So what's the initial term without the exercise of the option? The initial term without the exercise of the option would take us to April 2026. So there's approximately five years remaining. I will note that there what, is- What year are we in? Um, <laughs> yeah, so it's about five years only, but you, you see where I'm going, right? Um, I will tell you that in the lease itself, because we knew that it was very important for the tenant to make sure that it exercised the options and a lot of times leases will provide that the tenant has to give notice um, in order to exercise the option that we provided a backstop that should the tenant fail to give notice that the option would be deemed exercised so that we wouldn't um, have any footfalls in that respect. Okay, thank you. Quick question. Uh, Commissioner, uh, this is, yep, yeah, thank you. Um, do you envision any scenario in which um, the tenant would not exercise, um, you know, this extension? And has it ever happened before with any of your other properties? Um, well, we have ground leases at, at the other properties. They're not REIT leases. Um, and we've always continued to exercise the extensions under those ground leases in order to keep the property going. Um, so really I, I'm speculating, but I don't, I don't envision that, that occurring. It would be a very, um, unique situation. And, you know, and also we were very careful to plan for no foot faults by including that automatic extension, um, so that the notice would not, you know, trip us up in any way. Okay. Thank you. If, if, I, if I may just, because uh, I think that's a very important question, but um, I just don't see any higher or better use than a gaming operation for the real estate, which would be uh, an, you know, a scenario in which a landlord might want to not renew the lease or, or, um, or a tenant might not want to renew the lease because there's, a, there's a, the other alternatives. These gaming operations are really are really, um, you know, the, high, the highest and best use for the property. Yeah. Uh, Chair, uh, Commissioner, if I can also add, uh, there are also other governing documents that um, uh, certainly will have influence over um, MGM uh, Springfield's decision to exercise an option, including its gaming license and the host community agreement. So I, 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 I think you know, accurately, I think Todd said, um, the commission itself doesn't have control over the commercial transaction uh, to the extent that it doesn't require uh, a, approval in some way, but there are other governing documents that certainly would be taken into uh, consideration, um, ensuring that the licensee continued to meet its commitments to the Commonwealth and to uh, the host community. Really helpful, Jed, thank you. Yeah. Also, I can point out that um, under the existing master lease that the renewals are for all of the properties um, so that it's a package. So you can't just not 
exercise for one property and drop it from the master lease. You either have to renew for all or renew for none. Um, that's, that's the case up until, um, you know, the first four renewals under the existing master lease. Thank you. Next, Jeff. Yep, uh, back to me, Chair. Uh, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna first turn to uh, the form of trust, which Todd indicated was one of the two issues that we wanted to uh, discuss with the um, commission today. I believe that is part of your um, packet. It's uh, titled the Springfield Nominee Trust. And as Todd indicated, as part of a transaction that involves new qualifiers, a petition for commission approval of a contractual transfer must be accompanied by an executed trust agreement under the Gaming Act and the commission's regulations. And Todd also went through the basic requirements uh, of that trust. The trust may be necessary after interim authorization uh, if a suitability issue arises for the transferee. In such a case, the commission's regulations provide that the property subject to the transfer be placed in trust pending the IEB's determination ultimately of the transferee's suitability. If the trans, I, go ahead. I think that's, a, if I could just pause. Um, sure. The characterization of the, I, I thought I heard Todd say that too. Ultimately, this IEB will make a recommendation to the Gaming Commission, correct? It's the commission's determination of suitability, correct? I just want to make uh, sure yeah, that. Yes. Okay. Chair, I apologize. Yes, I, I probably am using the terms interchangeably where I should be a bit more precise, but the regulation specifically refers to the commission. Right, and, and, the statute, uh, and the statute, and yeah. the statute. And the statute. Okay, Absolutely. thank you. Yeah, yeah, no problem, no problem. Uh, so again, if the transferee is ultimately found unsuitable, the property may be transferred uh, from the trust back to the transferee. If the transferee is ultimately found uh, suitable after that, um, uh, process, then the property um, you know, certainly uh, can be, uh, uh, the transaction can continue, be closed, and essentially uh, we'd be done with it at that point. So really the purpose of the trust agreement is to allow for continuous ownership and operation of the gaming establishment by um, uh, a suitable qualifier during such time the commission investigates suitability concerns of the transferee after interim authorization uh, and or uh, in the end, operate the gaming establishment if a transferee ultimately is found unsuitable until the property can be transferred to a suitable party. In connection with the Springfield Nominee Trust and the MGP MGM transaction, uh, we do have an additional feature that would allow the property subject to the transaction to be transferred back to Blue Tarp or to the trust should a suitability issue arise for the transferee. Under the agreement between MGP and MGM under the trust, Blue Tarp may elect to have the property transferred back to Blue Tarp rather than placed in trust, of course, you know, with the commission's uh, input um, and advice as well. So like the trust, Blue Tarp would hold the property during such time the commission investigates suitability concerns of the transferee after interim authorization or continue to own the gaming establishment if MGP is ultimately found unsuitable. If you recall, a similar option was contained in the form of trust and transaction approved by the commission in connection with the PPC GLPI retransaction in 2018, which like MGP, like MGP and MGM's transaction only involved the transfer of ownership interest in the gaming establishment real estate and not any interest in the gaming license or any other change of control. There is a difference, however, with what the commission approved in connection with the PPC GLPI REIT transaction and what you have in front of you today in connection with the MGP, MGM form of trust. And that is that the transferor in this case, Blue Tarp, determines whether to take the property back or place it in trust, not the transferee as was the case in the PPC GLPI REIT transaction. The Springfield Nominee Trust and MGP MGM transaction improves on the option that was approved by the commission in the PPC GLPI retransaction by placing that election to have the property placed in trust or transferred back in the hands of a current qualified 
licensee as opposed to the transferee who may be having suitability concerns with the commission at that time. So the Springfield Trust otherwise meets the requirements of 205 CMR 116.106. And uh, as we indicated earlier, we would respectfully request that the commission uh, approve that form in advance of interim authorization. So Jed, um, Chair? I had thought that maybe we were gonna start with the other, the other issue because that was gonna be simpler. Um, and so, <laughs> Sure. Um, and then you just threw in a, a new issue for me to digest, and, and, I, and I have sure. to say I, I had trouble following it. I, I do have questions regarding the agreement. I don't know if my fellow commissioners, I want to defer to them first, um, but if you will allow me um, and perhaps my fellow commissioners to, to digest all of this with many questions, um, um, I, I look forward to asking them. Commissioners, do, do you have questions um, that you'd like to start or would you like me to start? Okay, um, Commissioner O'Brien, I don't know if you've had a chance to look at the agreement. I have to say, typically we, we might have been a little bit um, in a better position, but we did get this rather late. Um, so everything I ask may be completely, you know, something that you can clarify very quickly. Um, and I am going to have to ask you to clarify, perhaps after I ask my first questions, what you say deviates from our regulations. So I understand our job today is to make sure that this agreement complies with the regulations, which of course spin off from the statute, right? Um, precisely, I think section 19C3. Um, I think my first question, and I and I interrupted. I'm my apologies, but it's because I was wanting to make sure I heard correctly. Um, my first question um, is relative to section two K. And and if I touch on something that is part of the deviation, um, please please you know interject. But this is where you say that the parties to the MTA acknowledge that the transfer of the property contemplated that they're under subject to the approval of the Gaming Commission. And then in the event, after we grant interim authorization, I understand there's going to be a closing three days after that, um, and then we'll continue our suitability review, um, that after gaming, uh, granting interim authorization for the transfer contemplated by the MTA, um, we find reasonable cause to believe that MGP or any of its subsidiaries or controlled affiliates as determined by the commission may be found unsuitable. And let's skip that middle clause first, the or clause. Um, the beneficiary, and, and that's Mr. Stewart, right? Yep. Um, uh, sh shall properly transfer all of its rights to Blue Tarp. And that's because We've we've found that there's an there's a, there's an unsuitability issue, so it would immediately transfer. But in the middle, there's and I think that makes sense to me, and I think that sort of addresses many of the the regs in terms of you know, clause two of two hundred five CMR one sixteen ten, and then further down um, subsection eight seven and eight and and nine, but then there's the clause in between, or if the beneficiary is other, otherwise directed by the IEB. I think that the way that's written, it looks like you, that it might've been um, collapsing provision subsection 6A and B together. I think that the IEB exercises its discretion with respect to the transfer to the trustee under A, but I don't believe the IEB can, um, on its own discretion, um, make the decision of unsuitability, and and then and then it would automatically go from um, MGP to Blue Tarp. I think you have to come back to us so that the commission decides whether it's unsuitable or not. Us, meaning the commission, 
correct? To the commission. And I mean, the IEP has a lot of discretion on certain things, but it looks like our regs really contemplate that um, it's it's not only in section two, but even it's you know down in eight and nine, subsection eight nine, um, that I'm not sure what form it is, whether it's an adjudicatory hearing or a public um, hearing, but that we would make the decision of unsuitability before uh, the, the um, asset would be delivered to Blue Tarp. But, but Blue Tarp is the current owner. Right, oh, yeah. can, can you, I understand have... that. This is about really about whether we make the decision of suitability versus the um, IEB making the decision on its own. Yeah, I think that's key. Can you can you tell me again what section are you specifically? Oh, this is the our regs, and so because we have oh. to ultimately have a vote on whether two hundred five CMR one sixteen point ten subsection six, um, if this trust agreement meets those requirements. And I and I think am I reading that correctly, Chad, or am I missing it? Because I I hate throwing a wrench in here, but I have a couple of other issues. Yeah. Anyway. I think uh, I, I really think here. I you know I want to go back um, you know first to something you said that the that the you know the the, the trust itself sort of deviates from the uh, from the regs and to from the uh, statute. Um, you know it's our position that it doesn't. It contains an additional option um, in connection with meeting those regulations. Okay. Um, as to the particular as to the particular issue here. Um, you know, I, what, what's intended here is really for this to be um, an automatic to get the property out of the hands of an entity that the, that the commission has determined has some level of suitability concerns and transfer it back to Blue Tarp or the trust. This entire interim authorization and this piece is you know from my perspective to to have that be done all just about as a matter of right, uh, certainly with the input uh, of the commission to get that property out of someone who's who's has uh, suitability concerns. So I can't I can't come up I guess share with a scenario where I guess that wouldn't be approved. And I think this was intended to operate uh, you know in in from a mechanical sense for that to happen. As soon as the commission raised those issues, it gets transferred. Transferred back to the current owner, which is Blue Tarp. Right. But it's a finding of unsuitability, right? Well, no, no. There's no, a, that's, no, that's, well, that's what yeah. it says. As, as determined yeah. by the commission may be found unsuitable in the yeah. trust fund, in the trust. And that's also with our, so we have, you know, what I'm, what I'm really trying to do is say that if, the investigation starts to reveal something troublesome. I don't think, um, and then I look at also section, subsection 116, sorry, it's hard to follow, um, 10 subsection 8, Trust agreement shall remain operative until the commission issues the transferee a positive determination of suitability or the commission issues the transferee a negative finding of suitability and the trust res is, deposit, is disposed of in accordance with subsection 9. So I just think that it looks like it comes to us, and but I feel like that clause suggests that the IEB could say, you know, we're finding something and then it automatically transfers back to Blue Tarp. Is that what you're? Is that what you were imagining, or am I just reading it? Uh, I, I think I think chair that tracks the language of the reg, um, particular section C A. Again, for purposes of during this period in interim authorization, and then you have um, here um, uh, uh, in section A or otherwise directed to do so by the bureau in its discretion pending a suitability determination by the commission. So I, I look at there's a the difference trust, between. Excuse me, that, and that, that would yes. be a, the transfer to the trust. Right, that's just, right, but that's, yeah, that's, that's not ultimately your finding of suitability in connection with a final determination. That's just if the IEV raises a concern and they really have broad discretion to determine 
the seriousness of that, it automatic to me it automatically then triggers it going to blue tarp or to the trust at that point. I don't you, see that. You, 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 can I, I don't I don't see that you have to help me further. I don't see that that it's um, that IEB raising a concern automatically. Um, um, yeah. Chair, can I can I help with one with one point in the document itself? Sure, sure. Thank you, Pat. Good morning. In the trust agreement in 2K, it recognizes your authority to during the authorization period. So 2K, the way that it's written, and and to large extent with the the, the one um, exception that that Jed pointed out, this trust tracks the language of the prior REIT transaction that was before the commission. But in any event, it very clearly says that um, in K, 2K, that in the event that the commission, not the IEB, right. in the event that the commission, after granting interim authorization for the transfer contemplated by the MTA, finds reasonable cause to believe that MGP or any of its subsidiaries. So it's the commission that's, that's ultimately finding it's recognized in the trust agreement, finds reasonable cause to believe. So why do we have the next the or clause? What's the or clause in there? Or, or if the beneficiary is otherwise directed to do so by the commission's IEB. That, that's a uh, section 6A. Um, but that's with respect to the transfer to the trust and the not trust. the finding of unsuitability. So I think it's, I think it's misplaced. Um, I see that the, I think the IEB has discretion with respect to the transfer of the trust, but ultimately, and of course, this is difficult, um, but is that the, the IEB would bring to the commission concerns about suitability, and then it would be up to the commission to determine. Now, one of the concerns might be, you know, what kind of a hearing that looks like, and I think, help me if I'm wrong, uh, Councillor Grossman, but that hearing could be an adjudicatory hearing that's not public necessarily. So would you would you have would you de delete that that or? I would recommend that, but I uh, and then I do have a couple of other nits. So um, the other net would be I don't see um, I don't see subsection C addressed. You know I'm not worried about it, but that's on the timely submission of the application for it, uh, I just don't see it in the agreement. And then there's one other provision in, um, you know, we're not a party to this, but we are agreeing to it. So um, subsection or section four, um, on page four, it says notwithstanding any provisions, uh, this is with respect to compensation for, for you, Pat. Um, it does say that, uh, Beneficiaries shall not amend the provisions without the prior written approval of the trustee and the commission. And then it says, which such approval shall not be unreasonably withheld, conditioned, or delayed. And you know, we're not party to this, so I don't you're know how. You're not party to it. Yeah, I don't see why that's in there. That's just, an, you know, just. Uh, uh, it, it, I again, kind of feel we, like we, if we approve this, we're agreeing to, to those two things that I'm not, I, I, I think that they might. And then I do need to understand again the additional piece that Jed you you talked about. If you could just maybe show it to me in the agreement itself, that'd be really helpful. Sure, it's, it's actually back to that um, uh, uh, language uh, chair. It back in K um, and uh, and and really when you get to the end of that uh, section um, where it says shall promptly transfer all of its right title and interest in the property to Blue Tarp. And then you have an or to the trustee at Blue Tarp's option. Oh, That's there that it enhanced. is. Yeah, it was. That, it was there's flipped. that. This is. It was. It was flipped. So when we yeah. looked at yeah. the prior trust agreement that had been approved by the commission, um, the optionality was that essentially the applicant had not who had not been found suitable, and even though it was approved previously, we thought that the commission would be more comfortable if it's the existing qualifier that 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 decides on the transfer as opposed to a person who has just been found to have reasonable cause to believe that there could be a suitability issue so, we so that language was in the prior agreement and exactly. 
but it wasn't in the but is it in the reg too also somewhere chad um no where, that 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 i described is additive to the to the thanks. regulatory requirements we're giving another option which we think is actually to be quite frank in the Make better sense. interest of the commonwealth yes, yes I um, understand. so we meet and i and i know we're talking about some of the language here i think that's why i go back to this trust meets I, the statutory and regulatory requirements and then has to me an enhanced option um, that can be exercised here. Not anything I, inconsistent. Yeah. I, I understand that now. Thank you. Just seeing yeah. the language yeah. is hard for me to follow. Yeah. So um, with respect to the, the one I, substantive I guess, and then the one that Yeah, sure. I, I want I go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> no, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh no, I have nothing else. Sorry. Yeah, I just I just wanted to go ahead, Pat. Sorry. No, no. So just to, by and large we tried to literally simply track the language of the previously approved trust so as not to to yeah. to raise any new issues but i certainly do appreciate uh, particularly your last point with respect that you're not a party to the agreement and that can be easily corrected well and, and i'm sorry of course i'm the one commissioner that wasn't part of the <laughs> earlier commission but i did do my homework and i did watch the hearing i unfortunately did not review the trust agreement that was executed last time so i wasn't sure if it actually tracked the exact same language i think you have improved it with what um jetta said and i think that maybe my suggestions would be an additional improvement if my fellow commissioners agree um, but I do know that, um, you know, ultimately we do have to, um, at least I think uh, Councilor Grossman would like us to find that um, we, the, the trust does track the requirements of our regs and, and of course our statute. And I would just say there's a couple of things there that would, if they were eliminated, that clause in section 12, um, probably not necessary. Um, I mean, I'm sorry, a K, um, and then that one in, in four where you really aren't a party. So I would just take that out. And then if it could be executed again, I don't, I don't think it d delays your time frame, right? Too much. No, no, uh, not at all. These are, these are very easy changes to make to take out the, the wording between the two commas um, in terms of the, the issue with the IEB taking the the compensation out which by the way just for the record is zero <laughs> in, in any event <laughs> i was going to say it's I, that's I why i called it a net i called I it a net but I, did, I didn't do a real good job of negotiating for myself my comp um um i'm glad to leave it to the commission to to help me with that <laughs> but in all seriousness that can be that can quickly fixed as well I, I'm fine with those both two fixes. I um, I, I I see those both those two points. I think um, you know taking out the discretion of the IEB uh, relative to the uh, uh, authorization of the commission does no harm, and it it aligns with I think the intention, um, Kathy, of the approval ultimately coming from the commission, and and your your notion about the party is another. Um, um, is it, as Pat is it, says, you know, easy fix that would. Is it possible if, if in fact the commission is inclined to approve this today, could it be approved um, with the delegated authority uh, in terms of uh, getting the wording uh, satisfactory to everyone um, on the couple of nits? And I think, Chair, there might be one other or, or now. And I, I want to go back to Commissioner O'Brien and Commissioner Karen. Commissioner O'Brien, have you had a chance? I want, to, I want to follow up on the discussion about the latter uh, part of the language in K. My memory of why the discretion of IEB was in there is in case we needed to move with alacrity that we lacked as a commission if they found something. Um, so I just want to hear from uh, Loretta or Todd on that before we go striking the language or talking about striking the language because that was my memory of why. Good. Commissioner O'Brien, I'm sorry, I missed the part that the why. I'm sorry, I couldn't quite hear you. Uh, I'd just because... like to hear a little more on from Ivy and Todd because my memory of when we did this the last time was that the potential to need to move with alacrity that we as a commission wouldn't necessarily have if IV came into information that they wanted to quickly transfer back ownership wise, that that's why that was in there for Kay. 
maybe that's not accurate, but before we go talking about striking the language, I just wanted a little bit more of a discussion from IEB or Todd on that. You know, Commissioner O'Brien, I, I don't have a clear memory as to why that was, it's in the regulations as was pointed out, it's in section 6A, which gives the IEB discretion to order the property into the trust. I don't have a clear memory as to why that was included, but the, the purpose you mentioned um, makes good sense. That, that's into the trust as opposed to, right. yeah, out of the trust. So the language in the reg is into, not out of. Yeah. And then when if there's a uh, if there's a determination of unsuitability, it would you know go to back to the licensee, or this new provision where the licensee could say, well, let's keep it back in the trust. Um, but that's how I read the reg, and so I thought that it seemed it did seem inconsistent with the reg, which is. You know what I knew our, our job was to review it. I think IEB has that discretion in terms of the um, suitability. I, I don't think, you know, I think the statute does require us to make that determination as opposed to IEB. Well, we make the final determination. I'm just wondering if there's some interaction, which is why the language was in there. Can, uh, so the, the interim authorization regulation um, is for to one extent or another modeled after a New Jersey statute, which oh is the only God. other jurisdiction. No kidding. Know of. I feel like I'm getting <laughs> no <laughs> kidding. And, 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 and well, well, because and, and I'm, as I think about it, so the way that the jurisdiction was structured was you have a division of gaming enforcement, which you have now, which is the has the enforcement role, but it's a separate state agency, uh, and the IEB for essentially fills that role in the Massachusetts system. And then yeah. you have the commission. And but it is distinctly under, different. It's not bifurcated. And that is a distinct, it is. yeah. It, it is. And, and so since the division doesn't hold public meetings and what have you, but it is essentially the body charged with investigating, the way the interim authorization is set up there is, is that the division would raise that issue. Um, the, the issue of whether there's a reasonable cause to believe that someone's going to be found unsuitable, which yeah. is an IC interim casino authorization triggering event. I suspect that that's how the language got, it. got into the population yeah. in Massachusetts. Yeah, yeah. so, yeah, and, and, that, and that's exactly what I was thinking. Um, we just have a, we have a different um, statute and we have a different mm -hmm. um, mandate than New Jersey, but we, we like New Jersey a whole lot. It was those darn New Jersey lawyers that got that in the room. Yeah, I think that's probably right. <laughs> I, I can think of one I know. Uh, me too. Yeah, I, I think I think we're all thinking of the same person. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Commissioner Bryan, is that helpful? Um, yeah. Yep. That solves it for me. Thanks. Okay. Great. Um, so, if uh, Com Commissioner Cameron, do you have questions or observations or? I. I I, um, I'm in agreement that those changes are um, are probably make it make it a stronger document and, and more accurately reflect the um, the regulations and the statute. So well, I'm I'm fine with both. Thank so you for I raising. Th thank you. And I think Pat raised a good question, and I think it's probably something we can manage through a proper motion if we're if we're we're set to move would be somehow to to approve just subject to those changes being made, but I, I want to make sure we have that language, right? Commissioner O'Brien, I always turn to you for help on our, our motions and, and Councillor Grossman. Um, and, and Jed, does this work for you? Uh, yeah, Commissioner, of course. And this is, this is why we wanted to bring these issues up early to get this impact and have this dialogue. It would be very helpful to us if we could still have it approved subject to those changes and, you know, maybe delegate um, authority to the general counsel or staff to um, to ensure that it's in conformance with the commission's wishes. Yeah. Karen, does that work for you too? There we go. Oh, there. <laughs> yes, it does. I think that's fine. Yeah. And, and Loretta. The... So, oh, um, um, okay. Can you clarify exactly the language that you're looking to strike from K and 
So I think on Could it literally be the comma after unsuitable becomes a period and the and the rest of it is I second. actually think you would delete the clause between the two commas and because oh now you would keep Sorry. the first comma because then the beneficiary shall promptly transfer all of its right upon the once the commission may uh, as determined by the commission may be found unsuitable. Um, so it's the clause or if ending with in its discretion. Yeah. And so you keep yeah. Yep, that's right. And then the other one was just um, that wonderful, unreasonable, unreasonable cause that we all know and love um, at the end of, yep. uh, of section four on page four, that last clause, which such a proof of. So it'd be subject to that. And I'm, co I'm comfortable with having a Councilor Grossman manage that. That makes sense. So if we clarify it in discussion, it's easier to do a motion saying consistent with what was ultimately agreed to. I think um, that works. Okay. And that second question, I promised Jed, for me. <laughs> Chair, maybe we'll just entertain a, a second motion to prove that 45 you know, years is consistent with the statute. I'm, I'm, I don't want to take, I don't want to steal uh, the feet from the jaws of victory here. No, 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 exactly. But thank you for your patience. Okay, uh, Commissioner, uh, do we have, a, do we have a motion or do we have any further questions for our guests on this topic? The overview on the business um, was great. I know we'll continue to get updates on that. Commissioner Cameron, Commissioner uh, Zuniga, are you all set? Okay. And yep. We have a motion that would be great. Thanks. Well, I can I can make a motion relative to the um, to the term um, and, oh. and and comment, or or you you were expecting a motion well, relative to the let's, trust. Let's just do the trust agreement first, and I think there's a okay. presentation on the term. Thanks. Okay. All right, um, mm -hmm. Madam Chair, I move that the commission find that the Springfield nominee trust discussed today and as further specifically amended for discussion today meets the requirements set out in 205 CMR 116.10 sub 6. Check on that. I, it's, it's subject to the discussion and then I think we want to edit discussed. And, so and then and do we need to clarify that um, Councillor Grossman will will follow up on the getting the the seeing the next trust. Uh, um, I mean, I think it's if it's not executed properly, then it's not a lawful trust. But um, okay, I, okay, I, fair I, enough. I Good, think perfect. Do that. I think as a practical matter, I think we're all in agreement. But I don't think that needs to be in. The Thank you. Room. Thank you. Okay, and Commissioner Zuniga, you've seconded that. I second that. All right. Um, any further questions? Commissioner um, Cameron? Aye. Commissioner O'Brien? Aye. Commissioner Zuniga? Aye. And I vote yes for zero. Thank you, Tanya. Um, excellent. And now the, the, other, the other narrow issue for today, uh, Chad. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, and I'll, I'll try to be uh, brief here as well. Um, so as, as discussed uh, earlier and presented by uh, Laura, uh, we have a uh, lease here that incorporate, incorporating all the renewals uh, is 45 years. And that includes the initial term of the master lease, the master lease renewal, and the renewals uh, under the seventh amendment to the lease. So as Todd outlined under the Gaming Act and Commission's regulations, the sale of an interest in a gaming establishment's property is permitted but requires notice and approval by the commission. The commission may reject the sale of an interest in a gaming establishment's uh, real estate if the commission considers the transfer unsuitable or stated more succinctly in the commission's regulations, the commission may reject a transfer requiring approval that it finds would be disadvantageous to the interests of the Commonwealth. Neither the Gaming Act nor the commission regulations contains requirements for a sublease of property by a licensee that is related to the gaming establishment. Any lease term therefore may be approved by the commission, as long as it doesn't violate any law or regulation and that the transfer is not unsuitable or disadvantageous to the interests of the Commonwealth. 
As Todd pointed out in reviewing the lease term, the commission has previously looked at whether chapter 23K section 15.3, which requires an applicant for licensure to demonstrate ownership of land where a gaming establishment is proposed to be constructed, include a lease term that extends not less than 60 years. And while the commission has found that the 60 year requirement doesn't apply to uh, a licensee in connection with the type of transaction that's before it today, the petitioners recognize too that stability of ownership in a gaming establishment's property is important. And in addition, the commission has raised concerns or didn't raise concerns, I should say, in connection with PPC GLPI sublease term, which was approximately 35 years, which was ultimately approved as part of that uh, particular transaction. So Chair, here we have a 45 year lease term uh, it's permissible under the Gaming Act and the Commission's regulations. It doesn't, it, it's not otherwise disadvantageous to the Commonwealth. The term, including all the extensions, will be in place till approximately 2020, 2066. We went through the renewal um, uh, options uh, in a little more detail. And again, there is no change in control under the sublease. Blue Tarp remains the license holder and the operation, operator of the gaming establishment. And we therefore would request that the commission find that the lease term is consistent with the Gaming Act, commission regulations, and prior precedent. Thank you. Questions, comments? Commissioner Zuniga. Yeah, just a comment that um, I, I'm, I'm prepared to, um, to agree that uh, the section 15.3 does not really apply to this situation, specifically the term, uh, for, all the, for all of the things that um, Jed was outlining, including the, the earlier part of the presentation. Um, he emphasized the notion of the applicant, and they are now licensees. I believe what that section in the statute contemplated was the potential for somebody to receive a license and then turn out to not be able to construct the establishment as they promised because they didn't have actual control of the land. Yes. But that situation is clearly not with us. Uh, the license conditions uh, uh, um, for construction and development that were placed on the licensee were clearly fulfilled. Um, and all of the other things that, um, that Jed was noting uh, that, uh, that all the conditions remain and that the control uh, does not leave uh, blue tarp, uh, etc. I think also apply. I would actually go on to argue that this is actually an advantageous um, transaction as we have seen before for the Commonwealth um, in, the, in the matter that this is um, uh, a good way for um, get better cost of capital as, as, as we all know from the REITs and um, uh, more stability relative to um, the operations as well. Well said. Commissioner Cameron, Commissioner O'Brien. Uh, just to point out that uh, this presentation is, is very, very helpful, but we did have the benefit of a briefing uh, beforehand in the form of a two by two. And I always feel fortunate to do that with uh, Commissioner Zuniga because he does have extensive knowledge um, with these, and he did make the he made the point that this is uh, advantageous for the Commonwealth. So I, I'm in agreement that this is um, something we should approve. Commissioner O'Brien, I would agree with um, my fellow commissioners. I, I take the same position as a matter of law that I took when this came before us with PPC in the the language of applicant versus licensee. And then in terms of whether it's advantageous to the Commonwealth or not, I would agree that um, I don't see anything that's disadvantageous to the Commonwealth. And if it's advantageous for the licensee's financial well-being as well, that would be advantageous to the Commonwealth. So I would agree with what they said. Thank you. Um, I'm in agreement to, uh, I, I, I didn't participate in the 2018 hearing. I know Commissioner O'Brien, you were new to the commission at the time and you were you were part of this and joined Commissioner Zuniga and Cameron, uh, Commissioner Cameron in that. Um, you know, I, I agree with the interpretation of the law. Uh, I think that if if this proposal were um, the, for the change to were too close in time to the initial licensure or the term of the lease um, were too short, 
Obviously we have the option issue here, but I'm comfortable with it. You know, I might pause and wonder if it frustrated the legislator's um, intent. I think uh, Commissioner Zuniga is spot on in terms of what probably was on the mind of the legislature at the time when they had um, this requirement. So again, I, I if even if I do pause, I absolutely see no disadvantage. The timing is actually very similar to what you decided back with PPC about three years uh, that this change has occurred. And I, I do think it's an advantage and it's uh, an important restructuring that will um, ultimately just enhance uh, the operations ultimately um, at MGM Springfield. So thank you uh, for that. And I do think we need a, a motion. So Madam Chair, I would move that the commission find that chapter 23K section 15 paragraph three relative to the term of years under a lease is not applicable to the proposed, proposed transfer of the MGM Springfield Gaming Establishment and that the term of years proposed in the master lease and sublease before us is satisfactory for all the reasons discussed here today. Second. Thank you. Any further questions or comments? Councilor Grossman, thank you very much for this. And uh, um, we'll say our thank yous after our vote. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zunica. Aye. And I vote yes, four zero. Thank you, Tanya. Um, MGM team and affiliates, thank you very, very much. Very helpful presentation. Um, commissioners, you're all oh, set. Thank you, everyone. Oh, oh, thank, always, you. thank you very much. We really do appreciate it. I, I will reiterate my offer to help on my comp for the trustee. Uh, Commissioner Zuniga, if you want to do that, that would be great. Uh, but it, and also, thank you again. Thank you. And Mr. Stewart, if you're making your way up to Hanover anytime, the um, I'm class of 82 undergraduate. And so the um, homecoming is going to be full and open, and I suspect it's going to be a really nice day. Weather will be good. Oh, I can hardly <laughs> wait. <laughs> well, I may see my fellow commissioner there this year. So, all right. Well, it's, it's hard to get out, Thank you yeah. know, hotel rooms in the area at that time, so we better start planning. I know, that's what I'm saying. All right, uh, you're, it's already too late. But anyway, so it's always good to see somebody who knows that, that area. Um, thank you, we look forward to continuing reports and, and working um, for the successful uh, transfers that are contemplated today. Thank you so much. Thanks team. Thank you. Thanks Chair. Yep. Thank you. Jed, so good to see you. Hopefully in real life. You too soon. Chair, thanks for your time. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. All right, yeah. item, item number five. Director Lilios. And you're on mute. Thank you. Loretta, you're muted. I wonder if there's a little problem going on. Let me see if I can do it for you. I wonder if we... Um, hmm. There we go. Okay, is, uh, is thank it, you. I, I'm, so, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to do this. I'm sorry to do this. Is it possible to get just a five-minute break before we get um, into this discussion? Commissioner Zuniga, absolutely. That's always permissible. I just, I just don't want to cut it too short or want to be. That's okay. right. And and uh, if everybody could just hold, um, it is 12:03, and that did go a little bit longer. Um, thank you very much. Um, so what if we come back at 12:10? Okay. Uh, so we'll just we'll just uh, take a quick break. Thanks, everyone. We'll just do a, a quick roll call to confirm we're all here. Commissioner Cameron. I am here. Thank you, Commissioner O'Brien. I am here. And Commissioner Zuniga. Here. So we're reconvening uh, public meeting number three forty eight, and we are on our item number five. Good afternoon, now, Director Williams. Good afternoon. This item invites you to review the process for commission determination of the suitability of casino qualifiers. 
it's on for discussion today and we're looking for the commissioners to weigh in on the process. All qualifiers for our gaming licensees, both natural persons and entity qualifiers, undergo a background review investigation process for suitability that's conducted by the IEB. At the conclusion of the suitability investigation, by statute, the IEB makes a recommendation to the commission whether the person has met their burden of establishing suitability by clear and convincing evidence. The determination itself on suitability for casino qualifiers is up to the commission to approve or deny, and the commission makes this determination on suitability by a vote. You have experience at it. Currently, you see qualifiers, casino qualifiers on a periodic basis. They've been coming to you at public meetings like this one. You receive the IEB's investigation report in advance with findings of the investigation. And at the public meeting, the IEB, uh, most recently it's been through Senior Enforcement Counsel Kate Hardigan. Uh, she typically summarizes the results of the investigation at your meeting and the summary is accompanied by the IEB recommendation. Uh, in recent memory, uh, these have been what we affectionately, uh, ref Commissioner Cameron refers to as the clean reports, uh, and resulting in uh, positive determinations on suitability. Uh, in these public meetings, the investigators are typically present, available to answer questions. The licensee and the qualifier have been notified uh, that the commission will consider suitability and the determination again is at a public meeting not has not been in an adjudicatory hearing. Uh, and typically in recent years, the qualifier has elected not to attend these public meetings. In the past, uh, particularly during the RFA1 process, the commission did review the suitability of qualifiers in a public setting, but in the context of a full adjudicatory hearing. Adjudicatory hearing is a defined term in the Commonwealth's Administrative Procedure Act, and uh, suffice it to say, before any negative determination on suitability were to be made, an adjudicatory hearing would be required. It's through the adjudicatory process that the applicant's rights are uh, preserved, and it's through that process that would enable an applicant to seek review of any negative determination on suitability by the Superior Court. Among other things, the adjudicatory process gives the applicant the right to particular to notice of the particular areas of concern and the right to present evidence on their own behalf and cross-examine any uh, IEB witnesses as well. Uh, um, after the three gaming licenses were awarded, uh, the uh, commission uh, transitioned with the consent of the licensees and the qualifiers to a non-adjudicatory process um, for, uh, for these qualifier determinations. Again, where suitability was determined, determined in the public meetings. Um, for a time, the licensees and qualifiers were attending in person these public meetings. Uh, qualifiers were flying in uh, the night before or the morning of, uh, taking the opportunity in the public setting to uh, briefly, uh, you know, thank the uh, thank the commission. Uh, but they uh, evolved to anticipate no issues being raised uh, and. Um, you know, for the past couple of years have, have typically not been uh, attending. And that's not surprising, right? The three licenses were uh, awarded to uh, world-class uh, operators who do their own due diligence on new board members and new C-suite uh, executives. Uh, these individuals go through uh, the process in other jurisdictions as well. Uh, but it's a good time to review this process uh, for us, tighten up our process uh, where necessary. And the existing regulation does give uh, some uh, roadmap uh, and does state that after receiving the IEP's report that the commission uh, determines whether to initiate a public hearing or an adjudicatory proceeding. 
uh, again, in recent memory, the public process has been the, the default, the non-adjudicatory process has been the, the default. Uh, the regulation does call on the qualifier to consent to that process. Um, the, the commission may decide that it wants to make that determination, the public meeting or the, or the adjudicatory hearing on a more individualized basis. And certainly the IEB could tighten up the process by seeking individualized consent on those that go to the non-adjudicatory process. It, it bears noting that even for those that you might elect to hear in, a, in an adjudicatory process, you can limit the particular matters that you feel would need to be adjudicate, adjudicated. You may not, for instance, need to go through, uh, you know, an individual's employment history, uh, uh, education history, and so forth, but you could uh, limit to, uh, to an area of concern. One possibility that we've uh, uh, talked about is, um, you know, when the IEB completes an investigation report, uh, provide it to you and to the qualifier in advance of an agenda setting meeting, possibly in an agenda setting meeting, you could determine whether to put the matter or any portion of the matter, uh, whether it warrants a full adjudicatory hearing, or you would go elect to go right to the, uh, to the public hearing process. If adjudicatory is in order, um, the, I expect that the uh, legal division would assist with uh, matters such as uh, developing and providing the uh, constitutionally required notice uh, that would be required uh, and scheduling the matter uh, appropriately, assisting uh, with uh, any um, preparation of uh, documentary evidence and, and, and so forth. Um, so that's a, a summary of some of the points uh, for you to start uh, thinking about and weighing in and, and on today and giving some direction on uh, today. Thank you, Loretta. Um, before we get started on questions and comments and, and discussion, I just want to set the stage a little bit. I, um, I really feel that suitability um, is a core function of this commission, the determination of suitability. And while uh, Director Lilios is quite right, we, we're lucky that we do work with licensees that are world-class organizations and and that's a credit to the early decisions made by the commission um, <clears throat> whether or not these key employees um, officials of the organization are suitable are it's really core to our our mission i came on during a, a high profile suitability discussions in they were done in public. Um, it was an adjudicatory hearing that was done in public. I asked the question of both our, our general counsel and Director Lilios, you know, what exactly you know, is the appropriate forum? Because it, it seemed as though, on one hand, it had been very public and very aired out, and then on the other hand, we have those clean reports that get done very, very quickly and, and almost, you know, in, in, a, in a functional way, right? Perfunctory way. And so um, I, I asked Commissioner O'Brien uh, during our legal meetings whether we could sort this out. So I, I thank Loretta and Todd for looking at this and helping me think through the process. And then also, we, we went back to the regs. And I know, Todd, you will probably want to weigh in on the details of the regulations, but Commissioner O'Brien, do you want to weigh in now because your insights were so helpful too on process? Because of course, there's also more process related to the adjudicatory process, and Loretta just alluded to that. But I also think we can streamline that and not make that become such a burden that the default becomes a public hearing where we don't necessarily ask you know feel comfortable asking every question because we have a what we call a clean report in front of us so commissioner o'brien um certainly madam chair although i do think it's it might be helpful to sort of go through what the regs say we should be okay. doing and sort of how we have sort of 
drifted into a sort of more um, informal process, for lack of a better term. And so I think it's time for them to have the discussion of going back and having them lay out, and Todd can do this, you know, exactly what the regs say we're supposed to be doing in terms of process and procedure. Uh, not only for us, but also for the applicants, the qualifiers, because exactly. I think the process of doing the report and having it disclosed not only to us, but also to the person who's under review. And then I think at that point, that to me is obvious part of the regs. It's sort of a non-negotiable. And then from there is where do we want to go and where do we want the process to look like in terms of, um, you know, defaulting to a public process or defaulting to a more adjudicatory process, but then we have a mechanism that basically can quickly get us to um, something when, as Commissioner Cameron says, you have a really clean report. Um, and I made an analogy the last time we talked about it in my time as a prosecutor, where you obviously you have a motion to suppress it's an evidentiary hearing. If the person meets a threshold issue, the presumption was you were going to have witnesses and evidence and have this hearing. However, when the facts really aren't in dispute, it was not uncommon to also have stipulated facts. And then you were just talking about whether or not um, you know, how the law fit in. And so I see an analogy here where we very often are getting these very clean reports. And so I think process would be to comply with the regs that you would default into these hearings, but it doesn't seem necessary and it seems like a waste of resources on everybody's part. And so I think it'd be helpful to have a conversation of how do we get that mechanism in place where we're complying with the statute, we're giving disclosure as necessary to the applicants, we as the commissioners get access to it, and then we have a mechanism for determining whether, you know, we're sort of all in agreement, it's clean enough to go ahead and proceed expeditiously or whether this is something that requires us to go in more detail. And the only added piece that I'd say is that, unlike where we operate kind of on majority, and, you know, the consensus, I think there might, we might want to lean toward if one commissioner really right. wants to ask questions, we should uh, you know, allow that opportunity to ask questions because, um, and, and, and do it in the form that is right for the applicant to be fair to the applicant, right? right. But um, default to every commissioner should have the right to, to ask a question that really helps them make their, their suitability decision. So, mm -hmm. so, so the segue now would be to Councilor Grossman, to Todd, to go through the, um, I think it's helpful to have, yeah, if Todd can lay out, this is what the expectation is in terms of the, the regs, that would be helpful. Happy to do that. Um, as, and Loretta did a really nice job uh, laying out uh, the whole process on a high level, and she mentioned all of the uh, areas of law that are touched upon. But let me just kind of... Uh, run through those uh, with a little more specificity. So there's really three bodies of law that apply to this type of situation. There's of course, general law chapter 30A, which is the Administrative Procedure Act, talks about adjudicating particular matters that may come before a body like this and offers uh, guidelines to ensure essentially due process to anyone um, who may have certain rights that are being adjudicated by a public body and those apply generally across the board to all um, bodies. The second area that's important just to recognize um, is the area of the commission's regulations that talk about adjudicatory proceedings and that's contained in uh, section 101 of 205 CMR. And again, those are of a broad application to many um, areas that get adjudicated by the, the commission. I know you're familiar with those. It applies to racing hearings and all kinds of other things. Those don't specifically apply to qualifiers, but they also do apply to qualifiers um, as well. But more, more specifically, and I think the best place to start is probably in section 115 of the regulation that talks about phase one and new qualifier uh, reviews conducted by the IEB and ultimately the decisions made by the commission. And I believe these are included in the packet. And there's, there's two sections in particular that I think you'll want to have a look at. And the first is in 115.03, which um, talks about, this is post uh, determination as to whether someone or something is a qualifier. So we've already kind of crossed that uh, bridge. And now the IEB has completed its investigation. So what happens then? 
the regulations at 115.03 paragraph two say that at the completion of the Bureau's investigation, it shall submit a written report to the commission. And then it talks about what the report uh, shall contain. Um, and so that, that's uh, the, the starting uh, place for uh, the review. Then we move into uh, 115.04, which talks about how uh, the report gets reviewed by the commission. And it says that after the commission has received the report, that the commission shall determine whether to initiate a process for a public hearing or adjudicatory proceeding. So there is a decision point at the beginning of the process uh, to be made by the commission. And as uh, Loretta pointed out, the reg goes on to say that the commission may only utilize the public hearing process with the qualifier's consent. So the default, if you will, in the regs uh, is that there will be an adjudicatory proceeding. But of course, um, when drafting these regulations, the commission recognized that not every matter necessarily warrants a full adjudicatory proceeding, which is why it built in the provision that allows for a matter to be reviewed in a public hearing process. And there are a couple of uh, provisions that talk about both. If you elect to pursue the adjudicatory proceeding, we mostly move over to section 101 of our regulations, as I just mentioned, and there's a pretty uh, well-formed uh, roadmap as to the processes that attach. Of course, there's proper notice, a written notice that has to be provided um, to, in this case, the qualifier, uh, where the issues that will be addressed at the hearing are specifically outlined. And as uh, Loretta also mentioned, those areas can be narrowed. It's not necessarily ascension, essential that an entire investigatory report be adjudicated with a full uh, suite of witnesses and things of that sort. If the commission um, is interested in reviewing a particular issue that has either been flagged by the IEB in its report or upon reflection one of the commissioners uh, finds it to be of interest, then we can certainly just notice the hearing to adjudicate that specific issue. And that's typically done with the consent of the, um, the qualifier in this case. So there is some legwork that would have to be done if the commission were to determine that an adjudicatory proceeding um, would be the right approach. Uh, the, the second um, approach is to conduct it uh, such a review in what is referred to as the public hearing process, just pretty much as you have been doing. But the regulations actually require that a couple of elements be uh, factored in. And the first is um, that the report itself is intended to be made public with proper redactions. There is, of course, an understanding that there is um, often a good deal of personal, private, confidential information contained in these background investigation reports that should not be shared publicly. And so the regulation reflects that when the report is shared, that those areas be uh, redacted. But otherwise, that um, the, the report be made part of the record. Uh, moment, just kind of looking at the present. Those are um, some of the main provisions. I was looking, there, there is a provision, I'm trying to put my finger on it, that talks about um, allowing uh, the public to comment on uh, a report in advance of the public meeting. Uh, uh, Todd, it's actually, it's also in subsection three, uh, the um, uh, talks about uh, the form oral or written um, in conditions pursuant to which the commission will receive public comments. And I'm glad you're focusing on, on, on this for a moment because, uh, you know, really to, to give full meaning to that public hearing uh, context, again, we, 
that the reports made available to the public and, and they have the opportunity to comment uh, like similar to what we do now for the regulations before a regulation is promulgated you know it may be an area that you um, want to consider uh, again the context in which that portion of the reg was was promulgated um, uh, and I know Todd you were here at the time I don't know if you want to want to touch on that um, uh, in terms of it being in that casino application uh, phase but obviously we have not been uh, inviting public comments for these you know the, the sessions are conducted in public but we have not been inviting public comments there was a, a time when we went to the Commission requesting a, um, a new process um, and the regs were not amended uh, in conjunction with that but you know we did get the uh, we did work with the Commission on the new process but we have not been inviting the public comments or uh, there was a, a point where we stopped providing the report in, in the public forum as well. All set <laughs> for now. Todd? Yeah, so um, thank you. Um, the public review process, and I was, I've been trying to recall specifically, and you know, unfortunately we don't have really great legislative history on some of these procedures. But in discussing it with um, a number of uh, folks, one of the reasons we, we came up with for allowing members of the public to comment on a report would be as a supplement to the IEB's background investigation in the event that the uh, investigation was unable to unearth um, some detail um, that a member of the public wanted to share with the commission about a qualifier, that that would just give them a vehicle to do so. Um, and I think in certainly in the early days, um, that was something that uh, was seen as a value add uh, to the process. I don't know that it was ever made use of, um, at least not frequently, um, but that I believe is why that was included in the process in the first place. So I think that that covers a bulk of the regulatory process that's laid out. And as I mentioned, of course, there are specific procedures set out in 101 um, that would have to be followed that uh, govern the notice of, of the hearings and the conduct of any such hearing and written decision and witnesses and, and things along those lines. And certainly we have done this um, a number of times in the past and we uh, could uh, certainly uh, put a, a protocol together to implement that if the commission is so inclined um, to follow uh, that course. C Commissioner Zunica. Thank you, I had a question just on that last point um, about the public comment because I'm also you know trying to go on memory lane um, mm -hmm. and, and, and I'm imagining of course the RFA1 process that was highly anticipated uh, when everybody was applicants that probably had a, 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 that's when we issued this first set of regulations and that was with that in mind um, but on the public comment piece is see does the regulation uh, is, is the regulation precise as to whether we could allow public comment only at the time that a report has been made public or is it more general and does that allow comment uh, on an individual that is going to be um, potentially adjudicated or otherwise found suitable or unsuitable um, by just their name or their, you know, or other basic information? I think the, the regulation seems to be focused on the former, which is that once the report is complete and the commission has elected to pursue the public hearing process, then the notice that's released to the public will include um, a solicitation for any input. Um, with, with, with making available the redacted version of the report. Right. Okay. All right. 
And remember, that only happens with the consent of the qualifier. That's right. So they, they'll, you know, absolutely be on notice that this is going to be proceeding that way. So, and then just as a housekeeping matter, we had also talked about, um, my understanding is one of the reasons that the report stopped being included is you've got massive amounts of material that would be withheld for confidentiality reasons. And so yes. you ended up with massive redactions, et cetera. So we did talk about IEB um, going back and just restructuring how they present the report and having the report body of it, of the document itself be what would be presumptively, you know, most likely publicly disclosable information. And either ending with what is presumptively confidential and redacted or making those schedules or attachments to the report so that it was a lot, it'd be a lot cleaner to determine both, you know, for the report and then also the applicant um, whether choosing to ascend to go public or not with this process, they would have a better sense of exactly which portions of this were going to be released publicly. I mean, I I can only think of you know the what all the all the reviews that we've done, and and it's a very distinct, as I was mentioning earlier, a very distinct set of faces that we were. There was a lot of interest in the initial RFA one. Says frankly, uh, some of it as as a way to try to, um, uh, you know, have enough, um, you know, um, local um, idea in order to vote down a um, a proposal as 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 it was being proposed. In other words, um, um, as a way to campaign perhaps against um, a. Um, uh, the vote that, that occurs at the at the host community. Um, so, my question is whether we, and by the way, that was perfectly uh, legitimate, and we addressed it, and you know that was the way it, it carried on. I don't know that it was intended, or um, um, you know, the, the regular all the qualifiers that come and go after the fact. Um, and that, and I'm specifically speaking about um, whether we would want to have public comment. Well, you know, I think that this is a good, this is a really good discussion for us to think about because we do not have anyone in front of us right now, as opposed to, you know, having something in front of us and then trying to figure out what the process is. Um, I, I get that right now we're in a stage that we're, we're very fortunate to have, you know, predominantly straightforward suitability reports. Um, there, there could be where um, it's not straightforward, and so um, you know, the I'm hearing the default is the adjudicatory hearing. I, I'm very I feel strongly that we can simplify the processes that might have been something that was a little bit of a of a barrier to continuing adjudicatory hearings. And it's my understanding adjudicatory hearings can be conducted at the discretion of the commission in public or in private. Correct? Is that correct, Todd? You, that's right. The deliberation. The, the deliberation. deliberation. What you about mean, the hearing? Well, but the hearing is the hearing. Well. So the hearings are presumptively public, but there is a mechanism that the commission built in based upon jurisprudence that allows the uh, hearing to be closed to the public. You know, and, and, and I think sometimes because of the nature of these issues are so um, th private mm -hmm. that we might opt to do that because we certainly don't want to fail to ask questions because we don't want to embarrass somebody. And that doesn't mean that we're going to ultimately deem them unsuitable, but we should be able to ask questions in an environment that feels proper. Um, in accordance with the open meeting law, of course, you know, we have that, but we also have an obligation to, to, to ask questions and dig down and, and then walk away and say, great. Um, and so I, I think that would be another, the other option. So with respect to soliciting public comment, that's only if we go with the public hearing process or is it for both? That provision actually only applies in the event of a public hearing. 
That's in, is that by statute or by our reg? That's just in our regulation. Um, I, I can't say why it was only included there. Um, but I suppose the idea would be if someone in the public knew something that perhaps the IEB wouldn't uncover, that you're soliciting that. That's what I imagine, right? Back when it was decided. It is hard yeah. when it's... It may have also been to control public comment. I mean, when you read it, it's 115.04. I'm wondering if you're talking about the interest people had in the initial applicants, et cetera. It may have been a, an effort to contain people, you know, raising their hand at a hearing and saying, well, I have information relevant to this I want to know about. So it may have been in there to sort of make sure it was all controlled in terms of how we got it. I think that's probably right. right. The other distinction I would just point out, of course, is that an adjudicatory proceeding is designed to be more like a mini trial, if you will, and I shouldn't even say mini, it's just more of a, a trial where you don't typically just allow members of the public to offer comments and things like that. Whereas if it's a public hearing, you know, oftentimes the commission invites people to comment on uh, certain of its decision points and things like that. So it's a more appropriate in that uh, format. So I, that is probably why it was just included. There. Commissioner Cameron? Yeah, uh, first of all, I think it's really uh, important to have this discussion now because although we're very accustomed to, as we say, clean reports, if new forms of gaming are added, to the commission's um, uh, portfolio, something new, they may be uh, individuals and companies that are not, um, have not been vetted in the past and, and to, to iron this out now is the appropriate time. I really do feel that way. Um, as far as, as, far as um, it was always my understanding and assumption that if we had uh, um, a qualifier with derogatory information that was uncovered during the investigation that we would absolutely have an, an adjudicatory process. I never assumed that we would do, we would handle that kind of information and those kinds of questions in public. That was never my assumption, so I guess this is interesting because maybe it wasn't as ironed out as I thought it was. I really always, uh, and we just haven't had that in many years where there was a candidate, a qualifier that, um, that there was really a need to drill down into some information that was uncovered. Um, and, but I've always felt free to ask questions if there's something in the report now that, um, you know, that, I'm just not clear about. So I do think we have that right now. I, we have, I we have that, but we have that more informally where I don't get to hear your question, Commissioner Cameron. And I don't well, get to I, hear I agree with that. No, I, yeah, I agree yeah. that the time to do that would be, uh, yeah. would be in public if there's a question. I, I do. Because sometimes I might, if you ask the question, I might say, oh, I missed right. that. That's a really Correct. good point. And then I might yeah. have the second question, which then we need to really sure. chew on as a team, right? Most of my, my, many of my questions are as a follow-up to something I had thought about because a fellow commissioner raised it. So I do think that's really strong. I'm just wondering if we could, uh, and if the reg needs to be revisited when it comes to uh, public comment, we can do that. But for right now, we're just looking at process. And I'm wondering, knowing our history right now, if there's a way to you know, get these reports out earlier, um, in an agenda setting meeting, talk about um, whether or not any one of us has a question that we think should, and it should be, I agree with one, one commissioner should be able to trigger that. Listen, I think we should go to an adjudicatory process on this one and not talk substance because it is adjudicatory. And we, and we then move in that direction, whereas so many of them are, um, are uh, without any derogatory information. I haven't even seen a speeding ticket in a long, a long time. I mean, it's amazing to me how, uh, how clean many of these uh, qualifiers have been. But, uh, but we would be able to uh, make that determination at a, um, at a um, agenda setting meeting to move forward with the public um, process as opposed to an adjudicatory process for all of these candidates. So I'm, I'm just, I, I wasn't sure if, if, if that's what we're talking about now here today, what is the process moving forward? And I actually agree with Commissioner O'Brien's point that um, maybe there's a way to structure the report 
so you're not reading something that's, you know, you read three sentences and then it's redaction, redaction, redaction. You read another three sentences. So, you know, with all of the information um, that is public would be up front and then however we do it in the back, it's either redacted or it's, um, it is an exhibit. Um, we, we could handle it that way. So we're complying fully. So I thought that was a really good idea for how to, idea. How to structure yeah. that. Yes. So I just wanted to get those thoughts in as far as the process here. Really helpful, Commissioner. Um, Todd, if we read the document in advance of a, um, our agenda setting, and, and, I, and I hear Commissioner Cameron, we'd have to be very careful about substance. Uh, does, that, does that mean that the report is now in the public arena or can it still be um, preserved? for an adjudicatory hearing, and how does that work? I believe this, this is in Chapter 30A, and I'd have to take a second to pull out the exact language, but I believe it, it says that any document that's used at a public meeting be, essentially becomes a public record. So if you read it in advance, I take it to mean that it's not being used at the public hearing. So you wouldn't want to bring that report to the meeting and read it there you would solely want to be discussing the redacted version of the report. But I think it's fair to have read the unredacted version in advance, so you're well aware of all of the issues and uh, prepared to request that an adjudicatory hearing. Okay. <clears throat> I think too that, um, one other issue would be um, the inclination of a applicant if they think that it's going to be if, if the IEB flags well this is derogatory that the applicant might be worried about information becoming in the public and just make a decision based on IEB's flagging to withdraw which might be fair but I wonder how that fits into our role. You know, like how, um, and, 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 and while it's really hard to do this because our judgment, you know, we, we have such confidence in the judgment of our IEB, um, you know, could there be an, a, a time where what might be considered okay um, or, or not okay by IEB might not be the same, might not align with our decision. And, and I don't, that's a hard thing for me to reconcile from a process point of view. Um, but I see Commissioner Zuniga um, nodding. Um, you know, what might be troubling to, to, to you, Commissioner Zuniga, might, might not be troubling to me at all or vice versa. So the same thing goes with IEB. We see it in our own discussions among the four of us. So um, I don't know if, we, if that today is a little bit off in terms of the substance, unless there's some process that addresses that, that I'm in the regulation, Todd, that I'm, no, or Commissioner Zinnika, if you want to Well, add. I just, I just want to build on that, uh, if I may. The, what, what provision is there? What, what, uh, that, that may have us conduct an adjudicatory hearing in, in, in closed? Um, is so, that at the discretion of who, or what, 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 what might be a triggering effect of that well I can it's just two sentences I'd be happy to read that for you uh, just to offer some clarity it's in uh, 101.01 .01, it's paragraph 7 and it says that any adjudicatory hearing conducted under these regulations may be closed to the public at the request of either party or on the Commission's own initiative in order to protect the privacy interests of either party or other individuals to protect proprietary or sensitive technical information, including but not limited to software, algorithms, and trade secrets, or for other good cause shown. Such a determination rests in the sole discretion of the commission. Um, and that was included based upon um, a case um, uh, issued, uh, or decision issued by the SJC involving the Sex Offender Registry Board many oh. years ago. Uh, which essentially said that a public body can close an adjudicatory uh, hearing to the public um, 
for certain reasons, but it's best if it includes that authority in its own regulations, which is why we have included that. Now, remember, it's also important to remember that when the, the commission conducts adjudicatory proceedings, it's doing so outside of the open meeting law. It's sitting um, in a quasi-judicial capacity, which the open meeting law recognizes is um, outside the bounds of the open meeting law. So instead of those provisions of 30A, there are the hearing provisions of chapter 30A that govern an adjudicatory proceeding. So there are similar protections in place in both instances, but it's a different body of law. Uh, Commissioner Kim, yeah, just a point. It would seem to me now, if we, uh, if again, to 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 answer the question about, um, you know, if one commissioner feels differently than another, I do feel like, you know, if and an agenda setting, no reports there. Um, you just you just bring it for the purpose of schedule, and you just say, "Look, I have, uh, I am, uh, I am troubled by, uh, or I I I think there's some information that I think we should trigger an adjudicatory, and leave it at that. It doesn't, you know, no discussion about it. And then I think the um, private or public uh, adjudicatory process could could be maybe um, it would be I, IEB's responsibility to uh, be in touch with the qualifier and say this matter will be handled uh, in an adjudicatory and if those privacy issues are then brought to light it could be uh, it could be triggered at that point that it, it becomes a, um, a private adjudicatory process as opposed to public and that may give uh, the qualifier the confidence to say okay I Really, you know, I really want this job, and I, I'd like to be able to do it if I could do it in this manner. So, does that make sense to kind of have steps that move forward that way? I like that a lot because I think um, there's a tension otherwise, right, Commissioner? That somehow we're reluctant to ask questions because we don't want to embarrass them, mm -hmm. but it doesn't mean that they're outcome-oriented questions necessarily. Um, you know, in other words. It doesn't have to be so such a bad report that we shouldn't ask clarifying questions. Agreed. And, and that the um, process shouldn't be so overwhelmingly burdensome that we're reluctant to ask our team for the hearing. So it's actually two tensions, right? And so it's going to take some work on on process to make it streamlined. And I think Eileen, um, Commissioner O'Brien's got some ideas on that. Along with I know Director Lilios, you've got ideas streamline the process so that we're not burdened by that tension and then like commissioner cameron said you know it will give it will give the individual sort of some solace to say this may not be all bad they just may want some questions asked um and and um and we'll make sure to preserve their rights that are that are required by statute in the 38 process Commissioner Zuniga, you're nodding your head. Do you have something to add or clarify? No, no. I think I think uh, I I really like this discussion. I think uh, the insights um, relative to you know this could this has not been a big issue, of course, uh, because of all the reports. Um, but it's it's a very good occasion to to think about it. Uh, one of the many many benefits of having careful lawyers in both the staff at the commission is that those of us that are not continue to benefit from from um, from that including also uh, having new new commissioners come in and and, and take a fresh right. look at, at the regs that were promulgated a little while ago and and we sort of took um, you know we read them those of us that have been here for a while read them a while ago and sort of like you know went a, a little bit on autopilot for lack of a better word but um, I think um, that the briefing before these and this discussion today, whether it ends up being a, a, a tweak of that reg um, or not, um, just a streamlining of the process, like like we're discussing here with those great ideas to make workable um, a report that doesn't have to be redacted, a process that doesn't have to be overly burdensome for the vast majority um, of, the, of the reports, but the occasional instance which we may need to uh, trigger that uh, adjudicatory process with all the due process um, 
is really important. Well, thank you for that. And, and, I, and I have to say, as much as um, you know, Commissioner Cameron's right in the event that our regulatory responsibilities expand and suitability issues um, you may expand and, and, and suitability issues may you know, come um, before us in, in, in greater numbers, that's one reason to look at this. But I also was thinking in the event that we're going to get a new commissioner, how do we explain this process? So I needed to understand it myself. And so there we are. Um, and then, of course, Commissioner O'Brien brings her litigation background, uh, and and you know we've got Todd and Loretta with all this experience. So I think we can get there. I think the reg structure that was devised years ago still is completely relevant. Um, it's just that we don't want to overcomplicate or, as I said, you know, make a mountain out of a molehill unnecessarily, but still preserve the um, meaningful. Our you know our our input to be meaningful and the process to be meaningful. So, so uh, I don't think we require a vote at this stage, right? Um, this is just where the regs are in place, so no new guidance needed, uh, Loretta and Todd. Um, and then we'll just get an update from you as as we move forward on the process of restoring the process, maybe is the best way to say it. I could use a little more guidance. I, I think I heard it, uh, uh, maybe some um, ambiguity about your uh, your thoughts about the public comment piece. Mm -hmm. That's uh, fair. That's fair. We didn't really resolve that. So right now, you're supposed to, if we do a public hearing for suitability, solicit public comment. I think what I'm hearing is maybe during reg review or even sooner, we could propose that that Karen smiling yeah. um, that, that we um, revisit that I mean I we always want to be a welcome input um, but I, I don't know I don't know about that I, it's hard for me to imagine how that works it's well it's it's a requirement now that we're supposed yeah. to be doing that's right uh, so when we post the agenda is there is there any further you know, direction to people in terms of public comment, or we've been silent on that. On, on the uh, suitability uh, reports, we've I've I've silent. never I've never um, been instructed to solicit public comment for right. suitability. You know. So one of the things, Loretta, maybe would be you get together with Todd, and if you want, you know, the chair to to have somebody help in terms of even suggested language in the interim to make sure we're complying with the reg. And then conversation about whether the reg maybe needs to be altered in terms of do we really need to be soliciting public comment at this point? So maybe both of those would be the next step. I think that makes sense. And then revisit it. Um, you know, and, and actually doing it might well, let's see what happens if we 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 are fully compliant. Uh, you know, we have think that all of us know we have an obligation to be fully compliant with our, our regs and, our, and of course the statute. Um, but we have a process underway where the regulations don't make sense or might add unnecessary burden. Um, you've got your factors in place, Commissioner Zuniga and Karen. It's, it's on the docket. Then that's right. So this is where we look at it. And you know, this is, I know that we're kind of doing things sequential, but you know, on the other hand, if there's an opportunity to be focused while we're thinking about this, maybe we look at this at the same time, you know, um, Karen and, and, and RAK. Right. right. Yeah, no, that could very well be. We, we just on that process of regulation review, we have our first set. Uh, when we are right. ready, we'll come back and update you all. Uh, and, and that has to do with rules of the games and, 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 and things like that. But that could easily, this could easily be another, another aspect. Yeah. Um, Especially I, now that we have them memorized. <laughs> I, I, I think there's a, there's a tweak perhaps relative to the public comment where we could, you know, I don't have uh, exact language or a section, but where we could still preserve the idea that somebody could come out of the woodwork and say, hey, I know something or other. Um, but the reality is that, you know, the IEB's in investigation is just so thorough with access to so much information that the likelihood of that is, is slow. Um, but maybe we preserve the right to Yeah, yeah, preserve know? the right or, or or maybe just notify the name 
of somebody without necessarily the, the full detailed report redacted, let's say, mm -hmm. um, to, 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 uh, to get public comment. And I'm just thinking out loud here for a minute, but in my, in my view, there's, there's, there's potentially at least the, the, the way to preserve the idea of soliciting comment without making the overly burdensome part of having to wait for the full redacted report for us to be able to do that. Does that help, Loretta? So right now, we've got a little bit of a, we don't have a report in front of us, but um, you know, if, we, if the reg still stands as is, we'll just have to, we'll, we'll, we'll take care of some process to be compliant, and then we'll look at that as, give us maybe a little bit of a pilot, right? Okay. So. Todd, does that make sense to you? Okay, good. Okay. Uh, but Lorena, but you're, but you're clear on the rest of the discussion, right, relative to process and the agenda setting to trigger whether or not to trigger um, the uh, adjudicatory process, right? I, I am. Yeah. Loretta and Todd have given this really good thought. And, uh, okay. you know, my, uh, and our, our main concern is, well, for me, my main concern is, um, you know, meaningful participation by the commissioners and at the same time not overburdening them with process and I'm counting on something that complies with the 30A requirements that's not crazy burdensome. Um, I think we can accomplish that. And Commissioner O'Brien, I think that you've got some great ideas on that front. Commissioner Cameron? All set, thank you. Yes, yeah, so we don't need a vote. This is just a consensus, a good discussion, and we'll stay tuned, uh, have the opportunity to, when we do have um, another suitability report, to see how it works, right, and, um, and move forward. Excellent. Really, really helpful for me, selfishly, but I think it turns out I'm hearing that you've thought it was all helpful for you as well, so just a good check-in. All right, so that Concludes um, for uh, Loretta, you're all set. I am, thank you. Todd? Okay, then um, Commissioner Updates, number six. Do we have any updates? I do, um, Chair, if I may. Um, I want to uh, state for the record that I submitted a disclosure to my appointment, appointing authority, a 23B3 disclosure under 268A. Uh, relative to the, uh, the appearance of conflict of an interest, um, I sought and obtained uh, advice from the Ethics Commission uh, prior to uh, contemplating responding to a job posting for an organization uh, called the ICRG, the International Center for Responsible Gaming. Um, I, I followed their advice and complied with all the 268A requirements after what they directed me to an advisory that's specific to the situation that I uh, found myself. I am now doing this disclosure as part of the public meeting in accordance with the enhanced code of ethics that we recently revised to ensure that um, the public and you all know of this filing of a disclosure. Um, the, the, the specific um, situation is I responded to a job posting or the International Center on Responsible Gaming, um, which is a nonprofit that um, uh, has a mission of helping individuals and families affected by gambling disorder through research and evidence-based education programs. This position is for an executive director and uh, the executive director reports to a board that is uh, comprised of um, 13 people, three of them uh, give rise to this, um, the need for this disclosure. One of those board members is Mr. Field Satri, uh, um, who is, as, as you all know, the chairman of Wind Resorts. Um, another one is Mark Vanderlinden, who works for us in, uh, in the research on responsible gaming. And a third one is Mr. Uh, Alan Feldman, who used to work, no longer works at, um, MGM uh, resorts. Again, I explain all of this um, to the 
uh, attorney of the day at the, at the ethics commission. I filed the disclosure with my appointing authority uh, prior to responding to this posting. And uh, again, I'm, I'm, I'm making this disclosure in accordance with our ethics, um, enhanced code of ethics. I can take any questions um, if there is any. And um, also for the record, that disclosure in its detail is available for, uh, is a public record. So it's available to anybody who wants to see it. And I understand also what's distributed to my fellow commissioners by our own Todd Grossman in anticipation to this meeting. Any questions? Uh, I don't have any questions. I just want to wish uh, our fellow commissioner good luck. Thank you. Mm. Not too much luck. Hopefully the yeah. process is a little bit longer, like spring. <laughs> it's a little, yeah. <laughs> That's a two-way sword, right? Mm -hmm. Thank you for the um, for the update, and and it's a burden uh, that we've placed on ourselves, but I think it is um, it's helpful, uh, as you know that as you said, those documents become public anyway, uh, are public as soon as you file them. So thank you. Any other commissioner update? Okay, um, and then Commissioner Cameron, um, we'll talk about the agenda setting, but uh, the IAGRA uh, I think conference we're, we're continues. For, not today, but we are due for a update, uh, probably maybe as soon as our next commission meeting, we'll have an update. Yeah, yeah, we'll get it on the agenda next week and we'll have an update the following uh, that, Yeah, we'll look forward to that because the time it's approaching, right? So It, it is. Okay, excellent. Uh, so without any other new business, meeting, I, 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 I disappointed Marianne, um, and thank Aww. you. She, I appreciate um, everyone's uh, um, participation today, and of course the team for hanging in there, but most importantly the commission, this really uh, important work for us to do today. Uh, very exciting developments. Friday, I wish uh, PPC great luck. Um, that's tomorrow. I hope the weather is good for them. Uh, and I, I, I'm welcoming any pictures or photos of, of uh, their activities out there with the expanded uh, gaming establishment in their, their outdoor uh, seating. Oh, it opens tomorrow? Is that? Uh, yeah, is that tomorrow is oh. the 25th. Yeah, yes. I remember we had okay. thought it was last week. And they, uh, so tomorrow, and then that was reported on Right. I, it's tomorrow, correct? Okay. Because so I'm planning, I'm planning on visiting tomorrow. PVC of all things. I mean, oh, so well, you're gonna have that. Oh, you take yeah, photos for have, us. That would be yes. great. Yeah. Yes. Um, great. And and I did get to uh, um, encore. I guess it was last week, uh, and saw a lot of their developments um, underway, a lot of shifting, and and got to to. Uh, to see Jenny and, and Brian briefly. So Encore, no evidence of any plexiglass anywhere, but the vaccine site was still there, not busy. Um, Massachusetts, we should be very proud of, of uh, where we've gotten on that front. So anyway, commissioners, if you have nothing else, anything else you wanna to say to the team? Thank you for all the work that everybody does. Commissioner Brian? Yeah. Just thank you to everybody because we're finally coming out the other side. So it feels good. I know. I know. Commissioner Cameron. Well, same thing. Good work, everybody. Okay. With that, move to adjourn. And second. Right. Uh, to all the kids who are home, Commissioner O'Brien, um, they're all done school. Good luck. Uh, I know, uh, uh, Todd, you've got the same thing. I'm seeing faces. Uh, good luck with the, the children as the summer starts. and. Congratulations to them. All right. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zinnica. Aye. And I vote yes. Four zero. Thank you. And thank you, Tanya, for your good work. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Team Todd. Thank you, Loretta. Thank you. Hi, everybody.